why do they work if we know that films aren't real? And his argument is that our brains are wired to entertain the possibility of these things being real. And I convince my students this way. I tell them to close their eyes, tell them to take a few deep breaths. And then I say, let's say, for example, that I hovered over each of your mouths and you opened your mouth and I threw up in your mouth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and their response is usually, ugh. And I'm like, but you know, it's not happening. I'm still talking. And yet you're disgusted by it. So there's just the imagining it in your mind is enough to create that revulsion. And I think that's kind of the joy of horror. On one level, we know it's not true. But on the other hand, our brains are wired to think, what would it taste like if, well, if Craig threw up in my mouth? Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast presents Wicked Ramblings, an entertainment podcast that strives to answer the twisted questions currently burning a bright hole in your dark soul. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. How are you, Greg? I'm good. What's, what's our topic tonight, Karen? Well, I'm so excited. As you know, Greg, it's September. And the Scary Spirits Podcast presents Wicked Ramblings is going back to school. Join us as we are educated about all things horror film related from a professor at Appalachian State University. Go Mountaineers. We might be getting schooled, but I promise no pop quiz at the end. I'll bet you'll quiz me throughout. You usually do. I like to. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Go on. You want to know who our guest is? Well, Absolutely. Our guest tonight is Dr. Craig Fisher. You want to know about him? Doctor, you say, Karen? Yeah. All right, go on. Dr. Craig Fisher is a professor of English at Appalachian State University. His recent writings about comics, film, and popular culture have appeared in the Comics Journal, Appalachian Journal, the Complete Carl Barks Library, and in the books The Rutledge Companion to Comic Studies, The Blacker the Ink, African Americans, and Comic Books, Graphic Novels, and Sequential Art. He is currently co-editing a collection of academic essays on comics creator Jack Kirby with Charles Hatfield and Susan Kirtley. And his article on Herschel Gordon Lewis is forthcoming in a book on early horror edited by Stephen R. Bissett. Welcome, Dr. Craig Fisher. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Greg. Welcome. I'm I'm happy to be here, and I can't wait to chat. So, so you're a doctor, right? I am. But <laughs> let's. Yeah. Don't call me doctor or professor. I, I don't stand on ceremony here. I should have well, some sort of horror nickname like Igor or something like that instead. Well, you know, Karen's a doctor as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I always call her Doctor Karen. There you go. I feel like the intelligent quotient in this episode is. Way above usual, Karen. And Dr. Why? Craig. Because, I'm, not elevating Dr. It. Craig. I'm not elevating it at all. I just told you to call me Igor. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but never fear, I am here to dumb it down. I'll do some of that too. We'll keep it, we'll keep it even keel. No, so, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to, to chat. And it turns out, I don't know if you want to talk about this at all, Karen, that we know each other without knowing each other. <laughs> I know. We do know each other, sort of. I am your brother's wife's favorite cousin. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Even though. I'm and we both stood up at their wedding in, what year was it? 83 uh, maybe or something like that? It's 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so, just celebrated their anniversary. That's right. We Happy are. anniversary, Bud and Anita. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about years on here. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> 40 years <laughs> <We don't>. ago. <laughs> Here's a horror <laughs> reference. Teaching college is like a reverse Dorian Gray. They stay the same age, and I just get older and older. Every oh, year. that's true. <laughs> so that brings us to why you're on this, because you are a professor in the English department, and you right. have a class 
So what's your class called? It, well, we have a, a class called Studies in Genre. And in that Studies in Genre class, I teach a number of different genres. And one of those genres is horror. So I teach a horror film class about once every maybe year and a half or so. I also teach other genres. I did a Westerns class once. And it turns out that today's generation, not crazy about Westerns. So I didn't do that again. <laughs> uh, when, when they were choosing genres, were you in the room? Or did they say, oh. horror? Who are we going to get to do horror? <laughs> oh, let's get Craig. <laughs> actually, actually, I get to choose whatever genre I want. So okay. I'm doing experimental film this semester, American experimental films. So we're watching all these films by people like Kenneth Anger and Andy Warhol and things like that. I've done this superhero film and they think they're going to get a bunch of Marvel movies. And instead I give them like silent serial films from the teens mm. and Doc Savage oh, movies and like things the, like the that. The old so Batman like, serials, right? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And, I'm a DC and the guy. 1966 TV show, too. That's my favorite <laughs> Batman. <laughs> so, you know, horror is definitely maybe probably the most uh, popular of the genres that I teach. So you only teach it once every year or so? Yeah, once every year, year and a half. I mean, people are always asking me when I'm going to teach it again, though. So when I when I And it's a it, semester it long? Mm -hmm, it is. Yep, it's 14 and what's weeks. the class size? You say it fills um, quickly. Is 24, it 24? But okay. I usually have to let people in both so they can graduate on time with a film studies degree or because they had me for other classes. and They're like, please, please, please let me in the class. Oh, wait. So it's so usually you're, closer to 30 students. You're an easy A then, Craig? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Probably. No, he's <laughs> probably not. Probably a pushover. <laughs> <laughs> not based on his attendance policy. He ain't. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Here, well, I go, the, here I am using ain't with an English professor. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Greg sure said he would have before the night is over. So. <laughs> he said he would have failed your class on attendance alone. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did that. Depending on what mostly, time it was. I had one student who came up to me the last time I taught in person before this semester and missed like two months out of the class. And they said, well, what can I do to catch up? And I'm kind of like, nothing. That's like missing a job like 50% of the time, you know, so. So, no, we were just I'm, laughing. And it's better to start as a hard ass and be My more lenient later than vice versa. Well, yeah. I would have loved this class. We had nothing like this. So I'm kind of jealous that you get to go in and do this. And you're obviously a horror fan. Yes. You don't just you didn't just pick this genre as something out of the blue. No. You put time and effort into what you would enjoy teaching, I would assume. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. I picked it's 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 kind of incredible self-indulgence. I just choose, gee, what genre do I want to do this semester? And then I get to do it. It's that would be fun awesome. though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's great. Except for when they're taking a class in the Western and they hate you the whole semester. <laughs> I like my Westerns. dad would have loved that. I love Westerns. I like Westerns. Yeah, too. see. Yeah. And my dad did too as well. That's probably yeah. where I get it. Watching that's him, where I got it from. Sitting too. sitting in the family room with him watching you know, Westerns. Yep. My yep, dad we... <laughs> still does that. He gets mad if there aren't Westerns on. Well, there are whole channels, right? That yep. show like old Western shows from the 50s and 60s. That would mean he would have to have a lot of channels. Craig. And I think <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Instead of the three you get with the aerial. Like. Yes. <laughs> but no, uh, my de my favorite television show ever, I think, is a, a Western, Deadwood, which I think is a great show. But, but we're not here to talk about No, nah, we're not here to talk about that's, to... that's cable. Yeah, that's right. That's 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 where they can really drop the f bomb. It's like dead wood. So, all right, we'll circle back to horror. What sparked your interest in, or obsession with horror films? What what did you watch late at night that you well, decided, I man, I love this stuff? What did you see early as a kid? That it yeah. wasn't late at night. Actually, it was the movie for Sunday afternoon on the ABC affiliate in Buffalo, New York. And, so you grew they, up in Buffalo. I did. I yeah. did. Both my brother and I, who you know, mm -hmm. and Anita, of course, you know, lived like three blocks away from where we live. They used to show all kinds of movies that wouldn't that were sort of horror adjacent, often horror comedies. So I remember watching compulsively. They would show it at least twice a year, and I watched it probably for ten years straight. Um, Munster Go Home, the film version of the the TV show The Munsters. <laughs> Which, you know, got me sort of interested in, in, a, in a covert way in, uh, with the classic monsters, right? Frankenstein, Dracula, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They also showed The Ghost of Mr. Chicken fairly often, the Don Knotts horror comedy, which I loved as a kid and I still love. Whenever they show it on Spengooly or something, I'm always like, oh, good, it's The Ghost of Mr. Chicken. And I can watch that movie endlessly. And how old were you? 
Oh, when I you, mean, five, six, seven, you know, not very old at all. And you would just go, yeah. So <laughs> I was, like, was going to answer glibly you? and say I was 35. You know? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so your parents took you to these movies? No, no, you, no. These were on TV. They were movies oh, for oh, Sunday. Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was the title of it that. on TV. Yes, yeah. ABC affiliate. Okay. Right, exactly. Right. Um, what else they show? They showed Harryhausen films, that kind of stuff. I, I, I fell for it. I fell for fantasy horror. It was great. And then I remember you also. I remember, well, on Friday nights, they used to show horror films. They were probably 16 millimeter prints of the horror films that the ABC network, the local ABC affiliate owned. And I remember my mom when I was about 11 or 12 years old, she said, you get to stay up tonight, Friday night at 1130 because they're showing Psycho. And I'm like, great. Okay, (laughs) sure. I'll give it a whirl. And it was so funny because we started watching it and then my mom turned it off suddenly. And she said, I'm sorry, you have to see the film the way that I saw it. I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, well, I saw it in color. And I don't know why it's in black and white here, but you need to see it in color. And this happened like two or three times when I was like 12, 13 years old, when they would show it on Friday Fright Nights on ABC. And then finally, of course, when I started reading about Hitchcock, I said to my mother, Mom, (laughs) there's no color version of Psycho. (laughs) Hitchcock, you know, it was considered to be such an experimental film way out there that they couldn't afford to shoot it in color. And they wouldn't want to anyways, because it would lose that kind of gothic vibe. Right. And to to her grief, she kept saying, no, I saw it in color. I saw it in color. And I told her, yeah, it's not blood going down. It's chocolate syrup. Chocolate syrup. Yeah. And the only thing I can think of is that it left such an indelible impression on her on her sensibilities it just freaked her out so much that she remembered it in color even though she'd seen it in black and white mm. that was an early sort of indicator of the power of uh, horror films that and also going to the north park theater in north buffalo and seeing willard when i was maybe 11 years old or 12 years old do you remember that movie is that the one with the rat yes it's about yeah. the guy who trains the rats to kill like ernest borgnine and stuff i loved it <laughs> i thought it was the greatest <laughs> thing i'd ever seen up to that time so. did you try to get a rat no, See, no, you could, no, no. Okay. No, I didn't like rats, but I loved the fact that that movie made me feel weird while I was watching it, like terrified or something. I thought that was exciting. So that's what drew you in the feeling you got when you watched yeah. the movies. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, the affect, as they say in the, in the, in, in academia, the affect, you study literally how your body responds to being scared and, and, and how that's kind of a rush an endorphin thrilling, you know? So the kids who take your class, it's an English class, right? right. Yeah, but, you but also... film, film studies is in the English department here. So oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, so... so that's there are most of them looking for a degree in film studies then, or um, are they just filling their English requirement? Sometimes they take film studies as a minor because they don't like their business classes, but they want to have fun while they're at school. Sometimes they, you know, um, take it as a an English degree with a concentration in film studies. Just depends. Sometimes they just take it as a fun elective if they're done with their most of their coursework. So it just depends. Well, like I said, 100% would have taken it. <laughs> I don't know how well I'd have done, but I'd have taken it. It's <laughs> weird teaching these days because, you know, there's a lot of concern in the academy over trigger warnings and things like that. And you, as you can see on my syllabus, I have movies like oh, yeah. Audition and Martyrs on there. And it's yeah. it's tricky. I give them a warning on the first yeah. page. First, Guys, first page, a warning. Well, Given I wondered if you got any pushback is... from academic and <laughs> other academics or even parents. No, you've never gotten anything. No, no good. No. Awesome. No, I, I'm, I'm ha- I, I think that that kind of concern is overblown. I think that, are, you know, I mean, if you're taking a horror film class, you kind of know what you're getting into. So I but think just they the select fact out that they the, can take it can right. be a source of contention for people. Yeah, right. not here, not here. It's, 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 I mean, North Carolina is conservative in parts, but Boone is pretty liberal and the students who come here are a pretty liberal bunch. So it's not so much of a problem. And like well, I it, said, most people say, I don't like horror films. And then they just don't take the class, which right. works out, works out great. Cause they like Westerns. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> they just love them Westerns. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> so we're kind of going to talk to you about your class because sure. the whole point here is to learn about the horror films and things. And I will admit, and Greg is too, but I'll show you first. I bought the book. Oh, wow. Okay. That great, uh, great. you have on your syllabus. Cause I'm a nerd. Wow. And now yeah, I... I feel like. Did you like it? Dumb... Well, I only got it we on just... Monday and I just started reading it, but I feel like such a dumbass now. <laughs> like we're just talking yeah. about these films. I wish we'd have had this, this when we were talking about body doubles specifically. Yeah. He talks about film. 
I think he's really interesting in the way that he talks about Cronenberg too, which he and Cronenberg had a huge feud and uh, things got ugly with them. But I, I picked Robin Wood because he was one of the earliest of the film critics to actually take horror seriously. Right. That I was mean, my question. Why, yes. you know, he well, was one of the first people to take Hitchcock seriously. His, his book Hitchcock's films, which came out in 1960 was the first English language book on Hitchcock. We so, should tell the people the book we're talking about here. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Since they can't see us holding it up. Right. <laughs> it's Robin Wood on the horror film collected essays and reviews. And the, right. for those people from Cincinnati, it is not the DJ. It's not the oh, DJ. Is there, a, is there a DJ in Cincinnati? Well, named it's Robin Wood. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's there funny. Was. It was a woman, but yeah. oh, there you go. No, it's 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 I, I picked it for several reasons. One is that, and I guess this is no surprise, sometimes film theory and any kind of theory in in colleges can be esoteric. And I think one of the great things about Wood is that he's a really clear writer. And and sometimes I disagree with them wholeheartedly. For for example, one of the things Oh, I do too. Him, yeah. <laughs> Don't, I was like, here oh, we go. Me. I can not like, cool. here That's we cool. go. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and don't presume that I agree with him either, because it's like, I want to have discussions and, you know, I want to argue. I mean, he doesn't like Cronenberg. I teach the brood and we talk about his debate with Cronenberg, but I, I, I love the brood. I think it's a really interesting horror film. So it just depends. So what do you disagree on, Greg? So please? reading through the chapters, the contents, yes. I saw, oh, there's a chapter on John Carpenter. Oh, and it's only right. two or three pages long. I'll <laughs> yeah, read that's that more of a review. <laughs> and I was like, nope, nope. He doesn't <laughs> like he doesn't like eighties Carpenter, which I think is a real mistake. I just I strongly disagree. I think he, they live is great. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite films is The Fog. That's a really good film. The yeah. And of Fog. course The Thing, The Thing, right? I mean <laughs> yeah. great movie. So yeah. He kinda know. he kinda like writes it off as like He sees him as I mean he peaked with Halloween. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what he says. And he sees and he sees uh Carpenter as being a minor director in what he calls that whole sort of uh, horror renaissance of the 1970s, right? He privileges other directors a lot more, and particularly Romero, Wes Craven, guys like that. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not sure I agree, especially because I think Carpenter's films in the 80s are really entertaining. So even at the mouth of madness and movies right. like that, I, I find really interesting. But that's that's on my list. There you go. Karen, we'll be watching that. Mm. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> all right but i so haven't what, seen it either so all right what qualifies a film as a horror film like I was what, because about that. because we've watched what did we, we watch body right. double and what's we watched it's another more of one. a thriller i think yeah like know, what, but, but what's the difference between even we just watched what was it circus of souls or carnival oh, of souls. carnival of souls. souls yeah yeah so they're not really horror well i don't know so as a professor and your the best carnival you know, of souls was kind of artsy yeah very artsy. You know? but yeah. we so, watched lots of things we thought were thrillers that weren't really like horror horror so what's the definition your best you know representation of what qualifies as a horror film what do you need it's, it's complicated because one of the things that's true of horror of, in any genre is that there are tons of subgenres and they all specialize in doing different things for audiences, right? So we talked before about the fact that watching a horror film should instill, should instill some sort of chill or fear or disquiet attitude. I mean, literally, you can feel it on a molecular level where you get scared, but not all horror films do that, right? I mean, probably the best stab at what defines a horror film it was done by a scholar named Noel Carroll, where Carroll argues that there are certain traits that go into the horror film that help to define it. One of those things for him is, is, is a kind of hybrid character, a monster that doesn't fit into any of the cognitive categories we understand as being the cognitive categories that describe our world. Let me explain what I mean. The outsider. Well, the outsider, definitely. But even just on a sort of like basic level, there's people who are alive, alive yet they are dead, right? Zombies. And that doesn't make sense in our world because the way we categorize our world is that either something is alive or it's dead. It can't be simultaneously this contradiction, right? Or a man and animal, well, a werewolf. That doesn't make sense because he, he that the character of the werewolf blurs those distinctions between those different boundaries. Or even in the case of something like Psycho and other movies, man and woman, right? Which is maybe shows the inherent conservatism of the horror genre, but the idea that that line can be crossed too is something that other horror films, that a number of horror films do. 
including some of the De Palma ones that rip off from Hitchcock. I know. I was like, just thinking uh, about Dress, dress to, to Kill. kill. I haven't right, seen exactly. it in like, <laughs> I don't know, 30 years or 40 years or something. <laughs> right. Like I said, we don't talk about years, but when you said that, that's what popped in my mind. I'm like, yep. Yep. oh yeah, I think in Dress to Kill they did. Yeah, the Michael Caine and drag, right? Trying, yeah, I was trying to remember how that, but that's what popped in my head when you said that. <laughs> so one of the things that Carol says defines the genre is the fact that you have this kind of character who, who upsets our sense of the world by mixing together categories that are usually diametrically opposite. And there are there are lots of movies to think about it, that, you know, I mean, and a lot and all the classic horror characters tend to do that. But there's also a difference like an alien does that. But is that sci fi or is that horror? Like do you have to have bodies drop in for it to be horror or right. blood or that feeling of fear, like the feeling of fear is we watch like invasion of the body snatchers and things. And those are kind of sci fi. Right, but, but not necessarily horror, and they have the creature or whatever that upsets the the norm. They sure. have horrific elements. But what or, are those elements? Or what they mix? Or it? they mix genres, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about studying the history of horror is that horror has spliced with every single genre. So you have horror comedies. You have you have, you do have horror westerns. Right? I, know. I was going to say, it, yeah. You you haven't watched Billy the Kid versus Dracula yet, have you? For the <laughs> not show. Yet. No. Please don't. <laughs> it's terrible. But Westworld really could have bad. been considered kind of horrorish, yeah. especially. Yeah. I remember the original, like with Yul Brenner and stuff. Sure, Yul Brenner and the mask falling off. Yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> I think I might have saw that at the North Park Theater in Buffalo for sure. But yeah, I, I, I so I guess, I guess I'm, I'm less invested in trying to define what a pure horror film would be apart from those other genres, because it seems to me like the distinctions between various genres are incredibly porous. So, for right. example, when you're talking about science fiction and horror. They share a thematic preoccupation with the idea of knowledge, right? In both horror films and in science fiction films, you either have a, a film where somebody learns too much and that overwhelms them, right? You know, Dr. Frankenstein reanimates hearts from the dead and, you know, goes where God never meant human to go. And they do or, make you know, that very clear, yes. And, yes, very, very clear. Yes. <laughs> As, and science fiction films do that too, right? I mean, you know... Let's, 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 you know, to boldly go where no man has gone, but, oh, there's an alien on there and it's destroying the spaceship, you know? Yes. And then there's also <laughs> positive things about knowledge as well, right? So in horror films, the final girl figures out what's going on, is able to fight back against the monster. And the scientists can figure out, oh, the aliens are vulnerable to water. Let's spray them with sprinklers and chase them off our planet. So sometimes knowledge is good and sometimes knowledge is bad, but it, that idea of the knowledge theme straddles both genres, I think. And you said it also invokes a feeling and one thing when you're when you're watching it and one thing I think Greg and I have noticed watching these films is men and women can react very differently. And I'm sure all different right. people can react races sure. and react because there were films where the we called them peepers, where the <laughs> guy is watching the girl and he's right. like, oh, he's just Speaking checking of body in double. on her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and but he, even he, like rear window and whatever. Or Hitchcock, Frankenstein, it wasn't. It was could have been considered peepers, right? He's. But there are a lot of people. They're either <laughs> they're minor, but there's binoculars and telescopes sure, or whatever. Sure. And he's like, oh, he's just checking in on her, and I'm thinking, this is so upsetting to me. Like that, uh, just it, knowing that, you know, it is increasingly upsetting to me. I mean, we're maybe getting off the beaten track of horror specifically, but, but when I, every time I watch Rear Window. I think what a creep Jimmy Stewart is in that movie. He really is kind of a jerk. He's cruel to his girlfriend. And he also has, and I don't mean to get kind of riled up myself here, but he has Grace Kelly on his lap. Grace Kelly, one of the most beautiful women that ever lived. And he'd rather look out the window at Miss Lonely Hearts. And I'm just like, <laughs> what is going on here, pal? <laughs> But it does evoke this is a fetish, different, pal. <laughs> different emotions in women and sure. men. We just watched um, Wasp Woman. Oh. And we kind of got into an argument about how the pressure, I said, the pressures are still the same on women to look young and beautiful. Well, no and matter do what the makeup does to them. Right. And he's like, that's right. not, you know, we, did, I mean, it's fine. We just, I said, but trust me, Karen, no one wants you to look like these celebrities that have had plastic surgery. No one wants to see that. Shit. <laughs> but that pressure well, is there. I, so. I, I don't want you to look like using that makeup. That would be <laughs> right. Well, right. The, that makeup was horrible. <laughs> But it's just interesting to me that sure. different people respond differently. So even though horror films may have certain qualities, they're scarier to some people than others, right? I think I think 
again, I, I fall back on the work of other scholars who I teach in that class. And Linda Williams wrote a really interesting essay on body genres. And what she argues is that there is a subset of different genres whose definition is very much tied into the effect they have on the, or at least the, the attempt to have an effect on the human body. So for example, if you're watching a melodrama, a tearjerker, in the very name, tearjerker is the idea that you're going to be watching the movie and you're going to cry at some, at some point when you're watching it, right? I or totally you're watching will. a horror film and you jump. Uh, even a cheap jump scare is enough to sort of get your pulse racing. She also puts in the body genres, forgive me for being blunt here, pornography, which is designed to elicit a, a physical response, right? <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, please and tell us no more about that physical response, but <laughs> and I won't. But But, you know, so I think even in movies that, fail to, to create that physical response, one of the purposes of the film, a horror film, is to simulate the feeling of fear in your body. And that might be, even if it doesn't work on everybody, you know, one jump scare here, one jump scare there will probably have an effect of, of at least a little bit of that sort of, that, that sort of horror So response. speaking of body reactions like response. that, have you watched a film that's changed you? Like, I, I would say changed your behavior or just how you looked at things. Right, and right. I'll say I watched Silence of the Lambs. Oof. Okay. And, Speaking of peeping, right? When, right. When he's in the basement with the But it's not even that. The thing that got me is when he asks the girl to help him put the couch in the van mm -hmm. just for help, I 100% totally would have done that. Like, right. oh, sure, I'll help you. And then you And now trapped. I'm like, Next thing you know, you're grabbing a dog in a basket in order right. to survive. <laughs> but it changed my behavior. Like That's I don't, I'm much more suspicious about someone asking. Like I wouldn't do it if someone wasn't with me because I saw that horror film. Well, what I would, maybe it's a horror film, but that I, film. I wouldn't presume to understand what it's like to be a woman in this society because I think a whole host of vulnerabilities come along with that that I don't understand. But I would have done it. I saw myself on film. But I understand like, why you change your behavior as a result of seeing that. Like, I mean, no. Whereas I'm kind of like, uh, you know, maybe I have the presumption, it's probably false, that I would be able to defend myself, you know? I mean, I but think you've women, not I, seen a movie that's changed your thinking or like even an alien invasion. I don't know, an alien invasion. I have. Invasion. And you know what that movie was? Get Out. Oh. Get I Out made seen, yeah. me... Uh, oh, if you haven't seen it, I hate to talk about it. I was going to talk about the ending. But... Okay, yeah, take a lock. But anyway, <laughs> what happens at the end of the movie is that the police arrive. And for the first time, I felt like I was seeing the police through the eyes of someone who was black. And that was interesting because, you know, I mean, I moved through the society as a white male. And all of a sudden, I felt that protagonist's fear of the police. And it made wow. sense to me in a way that it never made sense to me when you hear people talk about it. The drama and identifying with that character clicked me in. So, yes, absolutely. That was very powerful for me. I'm Great. trying to think of other ones. I mean, I can think of movies that unsettled me to the point where I'm not sure that they should have been made. Uh, maybe, <laughs> activating, maybe activating a moral sense in me where I'm like, maybe this is going a little too far. I mean, as you can see from my syllabus, I teach a unit on torture porn. And we watch Audition and we watch Martyrs. It's a French film and it's tough to watch. It's, it's accomplished. It has a point to make and it has scenes of unremitting torture done on women. And it's hard to watch. And, and, and I, I make it a problem for my students. I say, you know, I lay it out there. Should this have been made? Let's talk about this. Uh, you know, taking the most reviled subgenre of all in horror, you know, and, 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 and questioning you know, it's morality is, is, is something I want them to do. Yeah. Speaking of sob genres, please. <laughs> in your syllabus, you have <laughs> your students write papers on a few of the sub genres. I do. I'm I sure, do. I'm sure these are not all the sub genres. Oh no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, I, I show them a form or an, a, a, some kind of diagram I found on the internet that lists about 50 sub genres for horror. Mm. And it's probably short a few. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, the reason why I choose certain subgenres has more to do with when the class is being taught. So I have a sub I have a, a unit that we did on full core. And the reason why I taught it is because full core is going through a lot of this renaissance right now where everybody's talking about it. And I don't know if you know about that long three hour documentary Woodlands Dark and uh, Witchcraft Deep, I think it's called. It's done by the uh, horror scholar Kayla Janess. And it's it's great. It's a survey of full core from. It's beginnings in the early 1970s in the in the uh, UK, 
up until the present day with movies like Midsummer, uh, The Witch, movies like that. So, so I knew that documentary was coming out, and 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 I, you know, I knew that folk horror was having a moment, and I wanted to sort of crest on that moment with my students. Greg, you know what? We should have taken. Can we audit your class? <laughs> because you know what we say. We like right. we watch movies. And, Why did you pick this movie? And we're like, because vampires are cool. <laughs> and you're telling and us they are this cool. whole <laughs> and they are whole, cool. They straddle the living in the you dead. Know, like <laughs> this whole renaissance of folk, and we're just like, right. yeah, vampires right. are cool. But we yes, but so we did we did watch the Wicker Man. So we had a little bit right. of in, intro, the old one, not the, the Christopher Cage Lee one. one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, not the <laughs> Nicholas yeah, Cage. I one. haven't seen the Nicholas Cage one, but I haven't heard good things. No. <laughs> But one of Greg's favorite movies is The Witch, right? The Witch, yeah. That's yeah. a great movie. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I not a lot know, of people I, in the theater enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll say that though, as the movie ended, lots of people. How do you were know? Grumbling. How do you know? Were they because they were, they were very vocal? Really? What did they yeah. say? They're like, "Oh my god, what was that? What's that all about?" <laughs> you no, know, because it was. It's very much. Right breaking the mold of the horror film yeah. right there's there's no jump scares and that, it's a right? slow burn it's, it's a slow, slow burn. burn yeah yep but i loved it by the by the time you get i liked it too oh, i you know by the time she's levitating in the trees at the end i'm like whoa this is good i like this <laughs> so that's the kind of movie that ends and i say i have questions <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. I'm, What's uh, happening? We have a deal at home. My wife Kathy will let me watch one horror film with her per year around Halloween, and we watch the. That's Witch it. Too. Yeah, that's it. She, she's not a fan. She's not a fan. So, although to be fair, she she has watched horror series. We all watched all of Lovecraft Country and and shows like that. So she's a good sport. That's nice. So yeah. going back to your syllabus and the please. Witch, for that matter, please. The one you sent us, that was the film you had your students write a paper on. Correct, right? correct, yes. But you, you told me you do change that from year to yeah, year? Mm -hmm. or I do, I do. So have you ever had them write papers on like Midsummer or The Wicker well, Man? Well, we, 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 we talked about Midsummer in class. And actually, I came to appreciate Midsummer more when we talked about it. Because the students really brought things to the table that I didn't. Uh, they were they were really fascinated with the film and they really wanted to dissect it. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I know a little I yeah. know a little bit about it. Yeah, you know? I mean, and and also it, it I did full core because I knew I was going to use that Robin Wood book because he wrote in a more clear style. He has positions that he takes that we could argue with or agree with, and he also has the first essay in there is an essay on Michael Reeves, the director who directed Witchfinder General, which is usually seen as one of the what is it the terrible trio of of horror films made in britain in the late 60s and early 70s that started the full horror genre that film Starring blood on Price. satan's claw right <laughs> blood on satan's claw and uh, uh wicker man are usually seen as the three that really get the genre underway subgenre underway i should say which so your general is amazing they do your students do bring things to you that you've not thought about before all the time and, all the time and just discussing it brings out more points and and they, are, and they teach you know, me things all the time that's the best thing about this job is that you know i may come in tired someday or you know saying things that 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 they're that they challenge i mean I, i'm happy to say that i create a classroom where they can say craig you're full of it and challenge me and we can have a good argument and and a debate and and it's wonderful i mean it's just a great job i love it i love it and i love my students Anybody who sits there and goes, this generation is no, no, no. They're they got it going on. They got a raw deal with the with Corona and you know and and everything yeah. else. But they 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 got it. They're they're good. the kids are all right in the words of <laughs> Pete Townsend. Quote, yes, <laughs> not to show our age again. But... Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Way to date us, Craig. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't think of a you know. Uh, what, uh, I know BTS quote fast. Yeah, enough. we don't <laughs> we don't listen to that, unfortunately. So I want to go back to your syllabus again. <laughs> uh oh, I feel like I'm on trial here. Uh oh. <laughs> so the Frankenstein Dracula paper, right? You chose <laughs> the Reanimator, right? Why? I love it. I love <laughs> that movie. <laughs> I I, I got to tell you a story about seeing Reanimator. I in undergrad. I think, I think it's very interesting. I never like. Yeah, it's a good. I mean, it's one to choose. Yeah. It's kind of the same. Yeah, it's like how does the Frankenstein myth of you know science going too far manifest itself in Reanimator? I mean, it's 
it's it's it's a it's a it's a Promethean myth, right? Yeah. Where Prometheus, Prometheus gives the fire of knowledge to somebody who's not ready for it, and that's true of Herbert West as well as uh, Frankenstein, uh, Doctor yeah. Frankenstein, I should say. Right. Um, I get a great story about seeing Reanimator, though. My friends and I hung out together in undergrad. One of the things we love to do is go see movies, and I would drag them to all the weird artsy shit I could find in Buffalo. <laughs> hallway so we would go see do you remember that version of metropolis that came out with the giorgio Moroder soundtrack the the disco the i disco remember king? yeah i remember but i didn't see it yeah i did <laughs> and so did my friends i dragged them to it. <laughs> how many friends did you have by the end of this <laughs> like three good ones who would go to the movies with me for sure okay but when i was getting ready to go to grad school in illinois where I got my PhD, they said, we're going to give you a gift before we leave. You can pick any movie you want and we won't complain about it. Oh, so I nice. broke out the Buffalo Evening News and started looking through the movie listings. Remember those? Yeah. And uh, Stop. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I feel like this is... Then you could call up memory. and get the times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We'll walk down memory lane Dang. with Craig Fisher. But, um, but I saw this movie that I never heard of that was playing in kind of this grimy theater in West Buffalo. And it said, just said HP Lovecraft's reanimator. And I'd read some Lovecraft and I said, let's do it. And we don't know anything about it. And if you've seen that movie, that's a real sort of over the top extravaganza. It's of, fun. It's great. And I remember <laughs> walking out, my friends are like, what the hell was, and I just said, you can't complain. You can't say anything about it. But Karen, to this day, they contact me. It's and, on our and, list. It's no, well, no. it should be. <laughs> but Karen, I was going to say, didn't you go to like Blockbuster once and bring home a movie when your girlfriends all entrusted you to pick the film? Do they tell, did. do tell. Oh, it's not this? as good as yours. Oh, I just please brought tell, home please tell. Elvira doing Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, and, like when she used to host it on. Yeah, like, and I was USA not allowed to go anymore. Or it might have. It was either right. that or the one with the slugs. Like the killer slugs or something. I don't know and if I've I was, seen the color, killer slugs. I was banned from going alone <laughs> to Blockbuster to bring on <laughs> the movies. I wasn't yeah. allowed. I had to have someone with me. They were always I definitely available. Had the though. reputation is the, <laughs> yeah. the weirdo who chose the weird films. That was yeah. that was my niche in our group. And for the Dracula film, you picked mm -hmm. Let the Right One In, right? Right, right. Yep, yep. Have you seen it? I have not. It's a great film. But I, and it's, I know it's, about it. But yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's and you it, picked it the really original updates. run, right? The a foreign one, correct? Correct, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's slightly better, although the American one is very good too. It's got a number of really good actors in it, including that guy who was in Shape of Water, the older actor. What's his name? Uh, yeah, he does yeah. all the weird characters, right? That yeah, guy? yeah, and he's been in a number. He was in uh, uh, Cabin in the Woods, for example, as one of the scientists with Bradley Whitford, but I can't remember his name. Oh, it's killing me, <laughs> it's gonna drive me crazy, anyway. So yeah, you'll, no. You'll I, think of it tonight. At there's a scene. If probably can't. Yeah, right. I'll device. wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, "Tom, so and so," or something. <laughs> I, uh, I think that there's one scene in "Let the Right One In" that's remarkable. Uh, that's maybe the best scene I've ever seen in a vampire film. It it here is pretty close to vampire lore, and so the sort of transgressively female male vampire says to the boy that she's falling in that in love with says. You know, I can't enter your house unless you invite me. And he's not buying it. He doesn't think it's real. So she walks into the house and then she starts to tremble and starts to bleed out of her eyes and stuff like that. Wow. And, so and she's a very sympathetic character, right? Very sympathetic. Yeah. yeah the, the vampires the are much more sympathetic than, than, yeah. Yeah. Much more sympathetic than most vampires. That's for sure. But vampires yeah. are cool. Vampires are cool. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good enough reason to teach that film. Dang it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'll admit that my, my love of uh, Reanimator is probably clouded by nostalgia. But I've taught that movie twice in horror, and once as a paper assignment, as you said, and then once we watched it in a theater uh, on campus, and they loved it. They thought it was hilarious. They had such a great time. So that's good because that last keeps semester their of the film, last semester of the films that we taught, you know, in an actual theater that we watched together as a class were Witchfinder General, and. Uh, Dead Alive, the Peter Jackson film from 1990, which is probably the goriest film ever made. It's something else. He's going to be restoring those to 4K like he did the World War One footage. I can't. I don't know if I can watch those movies in 4K. That would oh be too much, of a, too much of an assault on my senses. Yeah, so let, let me 
the worst horror film I ever saw. <laughs> oh, what, Dead Alive? No. In college. No, in college. Okay. Like, we sent someone the blockbuster. Wait, wait, wait. Worst <laughs> meaning... Like I had to watch. I couldn't watch it. I had to leave. Or worse, because <laughs> it's so so graphically yes. gross. Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. okay. So not just not bad movie, but just so oh, much oh. graphic violence. You I didn't see a lot it. of it because I'm like, you know what? I gotta go. I'm done. Life's too short. <laughs> it was blood sucking freaks. Yeah, that's a rough one. That's a rough <laughs> one. I went through a period in undergrad where I was in love with really bad films. So I would hunt down films that would sometimes be like the Astro Zombies or or Blood Feast. You mentioned Herschel Gordon Lewis in the introduction, and that's how I saw Blood Feast for the first time, which is purported to be the first gore film, although I disagree with that in my article. But but yeah, it's it's just so poorly acted, so poorly done. Clearly, the only thing it wants to do is like turn the stomach of somebody who watches it. And, and it's, you know, at, after a while, a steady diet of those films, I'm like, I think I'll go back to bringing a baby and watch that instead so I don't feel so dirty after I watch movies on the VCR. Well, and then even the not so bad, <laughs> the not so good ones look good after right. watching those. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the mainstream films just look more competently made like with people who can act. Which is well, Okay, wait. So, so all these films get made. Right. Like even we watched Plan 9 from Outer Space. Sure, or whatever. Sure, sure. And you think, how did this possibly get made? And I'm reading this book that you have for your class and, you know, all the thought and everything that goes into it. Who's kind of most responsible when, when you make a film? Is it the producer, the director, or the screenwriter? Like, who guides the film the most? I mean, this I know is each one... Um, this is going to be as wishy-washy an answer as my answer about genre and what defines horror is, but it really depends on the circumstances of the production. So for example, if you take a movie like Gone with the Wind, which is kind of my paradigmatic example in intro to film class, clearly the, the person- That's a long one. That, par, what, paradigmatic? The perfect <laughs> no, example. Gone with the Wind, oh. that's a long Oh film. yeah, okay. <laughs> I thought paradigmatic was- <laughs> That's a long one too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I lapsed into a prof speak there for a second, but- <laughs> But uh, my, my daughter calls it my uh, professor voice. I, I'll give her like a, we'll watch something on TCM and I'll go, you know, the freed unit at MGM. And she's like, you're doing the professor voice again. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but uh, um, it clearly is the producer, David Selznick. Because Selznick I'm gone actually, with the wind. Yes. Right. He used five different directors. The one who got the credit, Victor Fleming, was just the last one to actually shoot the last footage for the movie. But but he used five different directors, fired them, directed some of the footage himself. He clearly was guiding that thing from from top to bottom. But then there are other movies, you know, like, I mean, Ed Wood, you know, for all of his failings. And I actually like Ed Wood's films. He's clearly the, the quote unquote visionary behind Plan 9 or Glenn or Glenda. Well, and it's Hitchcock, his, too, right? Oh, Hitch, got, well. That's interesting you should mention Hitchcock because Hitchcock was brought over from England on a contract with David Selznick. So what happened is when the Hitchcock films they made during the 1940s, especially the ones where Hitch, where Selznick was the producer and Hitchcock was the director, was a constant struggle of wills as to who would get to control the film. And I think the Selznick-Hitchcock films are neither men's best work. So you watch Rebecca and it's like, is that as good as Rear Window or Strangers on a Train? Nah, I don't think mm -hmm. so. And part of it is that Selznick's penchant for, you know, big epics like in Gone with the Wind kind of undercuts Hitchcock's own concerns. Uh, he the, the best Hitchcock films are the ones where basically Selznick loaned him out to other studios because he got sick of working with Hitchcock and Hitchcock could do what he wanted at other studios. Well, Selznick was probably always chasing that gone with the wind. Yeah, right. Like you, you can't peak that early. Yeah. You know, you're in trouble at that point. Yeah. And also just Hitchcock. Hitchcock was a very careful director, storyboarded everything, but Selznick undercut him at every turn. When they were working on Rebecca, I think it was, Selznick was, uh, he would stay up with amphetamines all night, and write these long memos, 30, 40 page memos about everything Hitchcock was doing wrong on the film. And Hitchcock would get to the, to the, to the studio at nine in the morning and there'd be a boy saying memo for Mr. Selznick and giving it to Hitchcock and Hitchcock would, would look at the cover and then he would, in front of the whole cast, walk over to the waste paper basket and drop the memo on the waste paper oh, basket. Man. So that's the kind of relationship that they had. So got ugly. Oh, so what are your favorite types of horror films? You know, I was I was thinking about that. I think I really like art horror movies that are both horrific and, and give me some of those, you know, chills and thrills that we associate on a molecular level with horror films. 
but at the same time are kind of artsy too, you know, that they fall outside the typical mainstream of, of Hollywood film to do, you know, sometimes pretty avant-garde things. I'm thinking particularly of, uh, let's say, for example, a movie like Eyes Without a Face, the Georges Franjou French film from 1960, that's about a, a mad scientist who is responsible for his daughter's face being ripped off in a car accident. So he kidnaps women and cuts off their faces and tries to give his daughter new faces that don't, that don't take. And it's, it's kind of amazing. And it has a, a scene in it that's shot in almost, you know, with, with very little editing where, you know, he's cutting off a woman's face on the table. But at the same time, it also has this kind of weird poetic quality. The daughter wanders around with this mask. And I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's kind of half surrealist film and half horror film. And I love it. I love it. Kind of sounds like the brain that wouldn't die. I know. I yeah, yeah, say yeah. That. Exactly. <laughs> only a more, only a more hoity-toity version. Yes. <laughs> but I love the Fancy. brain that wouldn't die either. <laughs> <laughs> See, Greg. that's one of Karen's favorites. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> My mom and I used to. It used to be on a lot when I was younger, and she would always put it on. That, My mom liked the classic. That's cool. Films. My mom, before. my mom wouldn't let me watch Psycho because it wasn't in color. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> I also like. I mean, I was thinking in another example of a director who does really interesting, unsettling films is a guy named Guy Madden, who's a Canadian director who's directed a number of very strange films that are at the very least horror adjacent. Like his first film, Tales from the Gimli Hospital, is body horror like crazy. I mean, it's about this plague that breaks out in remote like Saskatchewan and people go to the hospital and the only anesthetic they have at the hospital is, when they have to cut off their limbs is like a puppet show that they're supposed to watch and be diverted while they're sawing their legs off. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just crazy. See, I wonder <laughs> if you get to the point like... You've seen so many films and read about it that it takes the next level to get to you. It's a little bit like, I think, Greg and I went to, there's a convention here for haunters, right? And he's a home haunter, so he knows a lot of these people. And we're walking cool. through the haunted house, which is supposed to be scary and everything. And Greg's walking by. I know him. He's a dentist. And I know. And like, so to him, he's only moonlighting as a zombie. Well, yeah, it was like, it was, it, it kind of took a little, cause he knew right, so sure, much about sure. it that he wasn't really interacting at the same level as say someone like yeah, me. I was paying more attention to the sets and right. And how they would do that design. And, and yeah, you're a pro. You're a pro. You're in the you're in the community. <laughs> so when you watch films, right. do you find yourself distracted by things like that? Or you can sit no, and watch the film. The first watch or two is is pure. I surrender myself to the experience. I don't sit there and go, well, hmm, unless it's really bad, right? I mean, if I'm watching a movie and I'm going, I'm bored, then of course there's some detachment there. But if it's a well-made film, I, I I immerse myself in it, you know, and then it's only later that I think about it. And I also think about it, as I said before, with the help of my students, like if I program something in the syllabus, I, you know, they'll always say things that will take the discussion in directions that I don't expect, which is wonderful. I love that. I got to tell you that one of the first times I taught horror, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we went to the, the Woods of Terror in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is this outdoor sort of haunted house slash different scenes. Like, you know, there was a biohazard scene and then there was, a, a, you know, a school bus full of corpses. And then there was, you know, you go in. I mean, it was it was great fun. And then we drove to Raleigh and went to the Rialto Theater where they did a full tilt Rocky Horror and stayed over in Raleigh. And then the next day on our way back to Boone, which is about a three hour drive from Raleigh, we stopped in Hillsboro because there's a guy who's built his house exactly like the Myers house in Halloween. And he was, and he also worked with Rob Zombie on the remakes and he was sort of the expert the on Myers the house. That's Correct. What they call it the Myers house, right? That's right. That's what they call it. So I we know. visited that it. and it was a great, a great <laughs> field trip. I mean, it was so much fun, but when I was, you know, in the woods of terror, I definitely wasn't going, Oh, that's nothing. I was going, Oh, oh. <laughs> I, was <walking laughs> oh I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> so why do you like it in movies, but you don't like it live? Because I feel safe in my house. That's fair. That's fair. You, there's you enough know, distance between. And you. But, there, be, but there are certain movies that she doesn't like either, too, because like what we did like a whole like lots of October. We did like a whole month of slashers. And at the end, she's like, yeah, I'm done with this. We don't <laughs> let's not do this for a while. <laughs> Some are better than others. <laughs> I think partly and I talked to Greg about this before, and I don't think he believes me. But part of being in a haunted house situation 
not to harp on it, but as, as a female, sure. I've been taught to be aware of my surroundings at all times. Yeah, that's and what I was so trying to when say before someone, you feel a vulnerability yeah. that we don't understand. And when someone's coming up behind, like just someone yep. just breathing next, like don't touch, you know, whatever. That's Because they're not supposed to touch, right? right. That's the rule. But Correct. Just Unless that. you pay extra. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what haunted houses are you hanging out in? Right? <laughs> oh, there are. You can pay to you be can. touched. Yes. Uh, no thanks. <laughs> in haunted house. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And my wife is kind of the same way. She has the fight, you know, flight or flight. She has the fight. So yeah. when we go went through that same haunted house experience, she was like, she was in her Muhammad Ali pose. <laughs> yeah. wow. And she left at, at one. She was done. She walked That's out. That's probably best if she's going to punch somebody. You don't want a lawsuit on your hands. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, I think it's just, that's kind of why I don't mind the, the movies because I'm in my house. Sure. Although I was watching Evil Dead and my son came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> Although Evil Dead is so comedic, so broad. It well, is. I guess the first one isn't. The first it was one the first I remember, one we watched. Yeah, okay. I and mean, I, I remember it. Sam Raimi actually apologizing for that one because obviously he's much more. It was kind of funny. He has an it affinity. It was funny, <laughs> but it the had rape more. Scene and the, it's, it's a little much. Yeah. And it yeah. Was That's windy, what he apologized for specifically. And I had to go outside afterwards <laughs> and close up the chicken coop and right. the wind was blowing and I was like, shit. And I'm like, it's not real. It's not real. <laughs> it's not it's not that they it's just was the gore right. and we had watched a bunch of slasher movies sure. and it, and it just it puts just me on edge right. well but, when i came home from the silence of the lambs i was living in an apartment building at the time i, I was walking up the stairs to my apartment i was like i looked under the <laughs> stairs and under my bed that's right, and that's right. <laughs> and then some guy said help me move the car <laughs> yeah can you help me move the couch and you're like no the experience that i had that was like that is that i saw uh, Dawn of the Dead, the original Romero version, at a midnight movie at a mall cinema. And you know, oh. you, walk, you walk out at 2.30 in the morning, the mall is deserted, your car is in the parking lot. I ran to that car really fast. <laughs> I, was, I was not having it. I want to talk about one of the articles that I do in the syllabus because it, it sort of connects with this issue of gender representation in horror films. And it's Carol Clover's uh, Her Body Himself, which is came out in 1987 and Clutter makes a really interesting argument about slasher films that maybe will make you feel better about them i don't know what she argues i, is I tried to convince her before you came on that <laughs> it's always the last girl karen it's always yes, the girl exactly that exactly exactly <laughs> well and the thing that Clover argues about the final girl is that you know a during the 1970s and 80s, the audience that was watching these films was predominantly male. Not exclusively, but predominantly male. Usually teenage guys or guys in their early 20s or something like that. I probably was one of them. I think Which I was one of them. Which is weird because they're about teens being killed. Yes, but, but, but they're about identification, which is the fancy word that we use in order to talk about the kind of relationship we have with the character. That is, if you've ever watched a film and a character is threatened and you feel threatened too, you have a close identification with them. It's kind of like the fancy word for feeling the experience of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So here's a predominantly male audience watching these movies where a final girl stands up against a monster and Clover argues that you, there's all these men in the audience identifying with what it means to be female through the final girl. So what, is, what Clover is saying, she's saying, you know, it's kind of feminist when you think about it. I mean, it has its cakes and eat it too, right? If you go for the violence, there's plenty of that. There's plenty of women being killed. But the fact that the final girl stands up against the monster and that there all these guys are like basically pretending to be a woman for the 90 minutes or 100 minutes or 120 minutes that they're watching the film – you know, it goes against, let's say, for example, most Hollywood films where you're asked to identify with male characters instead of female. So, true. It is true. So I don't know if that I don't know if you buy that. But I mean, if you do, then weirdly enough, slasher films can be both offensive and kind of weirdly feminist at the same time. That's that's what I was trying to tell you earlier, Karen. Exactly oh, that, what he said. Is that what you, is that what you were trying to say? Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, there's things about that article that bug me. Like I, I'm not a Freudian, so she relies a lot on Freud, and I I'm not buying it. But I think that the point is well taken, which is you have these strong characters, right? And you can even see that strong character start to manifest itself in other than in genres other than horror, right? Ripley in Alien, right? 
where she's the one who's the last one on the ship and she kicks the alien's ass at the end, you know? I mean, she survives, you know? What's the Terminator She where she kills all the... Right, the Terminator's yeah. another great example. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, And so at least, you know, in the hard body 80s where most of the heroes were Arnold or right. Sylvester Stallone, you know, winning the Vietnam War for us, you at least had these final girls in different genres as action heroes that could provide an alternative to the really hard body masculinity of the 1980s. So that's cool. So why do you think people like to be scared? I go back to, to Noel Carroll. He argues that there is a kind of a paradox of fiction that has to have some sort of resolution, right? Because if we believe what we're seeing up on the screen for the period that we're watching it, we would probably freak out, run out of the theater and call the police, right? So you'd be watching a slasher film. And if there is some sort of psychic mechanism that clicks in and convinces you of what you're seeing is real, that's not our experience in movie theaters because we know on some level that they're not real and yet we still care about them. So we cry when we watch a movie, even when we know cognitively and rationally that's not real. So Carol is like, well, why do horror films or other films that elicit any kind of emotion? Why do they work if we know that films aren't real? And his argument is that our brains are wired to entertain the possibility of these things being real. And I convince my students this way. I tell them to close their eyes, tell them to take a few deep breaths. And then I say, let's say, for example, that I hovered over each of your mouths and you opened your mouth and I threw up in your mouth. <laughs> okay. And their response is usually, Ugh! and I'm like, but you know, it's not happening. I'm still talking. And yet you're disgusted by it. So there's just the, imagining it in your mind is enough to create that revulsion. And I think that's kind of the joy of horror. On one level, we know it's not true, but on the other hand, our brains are wired to think, what would it taste like if, well, if Craig threw up in my mouth? God, this is a terrible day. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it, our brains are but wired what, what to think about. What do we take from it? Do we take, do we feel right. good afterwards because we know it's not real? And so we walk out of the theater going, like, thank God it's not real. Well, that's like what there's... Aristotle argued, right? Aristotle argued for the idea of That's catharsis. what I was going to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that's... And that's... <laughs> but that's what he basically argued. He says, when you watch Go a on, tragedy... Go on, Dr. Karen. <laughs> <laughs> when you watch a tragedy and you see poor Oedipus Rex, you know, going crazy, sleeping with his mom by mistake, you know, I mean, we see the downfall of a man through no fault of his own. And, and basically what we have is a purgation of emotions. We cry for him because of what he's experienced. And in some ways, it's the, it's the very definition of a good cry, right? You have a good cry and you feel cleansed by that good cry. So it's and almost a stress ours. release. Then. Yeah, I think that's kind of. of. I think, I think, think it depends. What if it was me? What if that was me? What would I do? <laughs> I mean, uh, horror films, some horror films provide stress relief and some don't, right? I mean, there's debates over it. You just said you saw... Uh, uh, what is it? Invasion of the Body Snatchers, right? And they wanted that movie to end with Kevin McCarthy in the middle of the road going, you're next. And it doesn't. It ends with that fake coda where it's like, oh, there are right. all these trucks driving around with the pods in the back. So there's more hope for humanity. But even even if you go with that ending, it's kind of like, you know, there's no catharsis there because there's no closure on the threat, right? So I think it depends on the horror film, but I think you, some horror films do provide catharsis, especially it's ones, whether they have the a final sequel, girl defeats monsters. Yeah, right. A, like ability yeah. to have a sequel because right. that's what I I like. like Halloween the, ending with he was the boogeyman and then he's gone. Right. Right. He falls out that, the, that on the lawn and then he's gone. Or well, even the sign like this five headed shark and they kill it and then there's the baby. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's the, always the baby. There's right. Or something baby. like that. I always yeah. like, ooh, sequel. Karen loves a good open ended. Ending. Yes. So that's not <laughs> catharsis, I would argue, because right. there's no closure on stopping the menace. Right. <laughs> Have you ever seen Zoltan Hound of Dracula? I think that's yeah, what but it's it called. sounds familiar. Yeah, oh, it's it sounds terrible. familiar to me. Too. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Don't then I'm it. surprised I but haven't it, but seen it. But it ends with that Zoltan had puppies, you know, sort of oh, shot, you know. No. <laughs> so it's terrible. It's terrible. Wait, what, what is that one? I'm I think it's right Zoltan there. Hound Zoltan. of Dracula. Hound, yeah, it's real bad. <laughs> oh, it's about the dog. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, oh, it's terrible. Interesting. But then the dog has puppies and it ends on that sort of. That's what movie. I mean. See, that's. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. It's so silly. God, I've seen a lot of goofy goofy films I just... all right so what's the worst film you've seen i mean and i'm talking that you thought was bad 
horrible would never like recommend poorly like, made or i have objections to it because it's well, we'll tell things. do do both which one like zoltan hound of dracula mm. would be poorly made <laughs> yeah zoltan be up there it's pretty bad <laughs> yeah but what yeah. would okay so what do you have i remember are there seeing others on vhs a a uh eight millimeter film that was transferred to vhs at the local video store in champagne called curse of the queer wolf which basically mm. when the when the moon comes up somebody turns gay and in order to kill them you have to put like a stake up their ass and drive it up their ass oh it was offensive both in, a, in terms of its form and its story <laughs> okay that's pretty, pretty bad yeah. pretty rotten we used to go to this one video store called carnival video and they always had you know the really bad horror films in the oversized boxes you know if it's an oversized box it's usually terrible and if you've never heard of it it's usually terrible and i would rent everything there and i saw everything from like the really interesting dario argento films to crap like curse the queer wolf so yeah that was my graduate school education sadly enough <laughs> <laughs> all right so you've given us terrible ones what are your favorites oh gosh i mean a I lot know of them that- are on the a lot of them are on the syllabus. I mean, I could go on about Let the Right One In. I think that's a great film. I think I think Witchfinder General, I went through a real sort of Michael Reeves thing. The first article in the Robin Wood book is about Michael Reeves because he died of an overdose at age 26 after just completing three films. And Witchfinder General was the last. And I was so taken with it that I wanted to read it more. And then I bought that book and then I thought, hey, this might work for class and then kind of designed the syllabus around it. So it was a series, but but Michael Reeves got me started on that. And he made a really interesting film called The Sorcerers, which stars Boris Karloff as a scientist who lives with his wife in this terrible flat, but they've created a device where if they put the person in the device, they can share the memories and experiences of that person and start to manipulate that person. So like a, a young actor, What's his name? Ian. Uh, I can't remember. He's in uh, Witchfinder General, too. He is submitted Ogilvy. to the device. Ogilvy, right. He is submitted to the device. And what's interesting about it is that, you know, the two people who built the device are elderly. And the woman in particular is like, this is awesome because she f- keeps pushing him to do things like kill people and, you know, have sex and stuff like that just so she can experience it and have the experience of being in a young body again it's it's kind of an amazing film and it's an amazing metaphor for cinema because what we do when we go to watch a movie is we identify with these characters that will do things that we'll never do in our everyday life and that comes with a certain amount of catharsis and escapism too you know it, it's fun to pretend to not be yourself for 90 minutes and do things that would be unthinkable in your everyday life even that film is remarkable so michael reeves's films are those two in particular. So is that what inspired you to start teaching the class? Is that what you said? Or no, well, that, that inspired me, which finder general inspired me to teach the unit on full core for sure. Okay. Um, I've taught the class before, but I Reeves was a late discovery for me. I only discovered him a couple of years ago. And when I did, I'm like, Oh, next time I do horror, I'm doing this one. So he only did so, like four sure films, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and some, yeah, here. no, he did very few films and then died very, very young. Tragic. All right. Greg is Googling. I just want you to know he's not just pulling all this out of his ass. I just... But I did know, Karen, I did know that there was a metal band called Witchfinder General. I yes, yes, that. there is a metal band called Witchfinder General. It's true. It's true. I've never heard them, actually. Are they good? I don't I don't know. I've never heard them, but I know of them. They're doom metal. And I, I kind of right. like doom metal. I don't. You know, though, I, I'm, I'm a punk. I probably have heard them more than actually metal or so, you know, I'd be more likely to listen to the Ramones, which finder general, I think. <laughs> Speaking of that, I mean, I know you said you're not much of a soundtrack guy, but are right. there movies that you think oh, would be Karen, different? You're stealing my thunder. Oh, sorry, go go on. <laughs> what do you guys think of Goblin's soundtracks for movies like Suspiria? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> okay. Suspiria is the 1977 Dario Argento film, and it has the loudest, weirdest soundtrack of any movie I've ever heard. It's fascinating, but I don't know what I don't know if it's great or if it's intrusive. I can't tell. I can't figure it out. Sometimes just, the music is distracting. Yeah, there was I, a part in uh, Wicker here Man. The music remember? Is wildly distracting, but not that um, song they sing at the end, right? <laughs> no, but like they were running through the caves <laughs> or the something, burning. and it was like this seventies disco That's true. It was. weirdness <laughs> there was that, that didn't fit at all or with they the rest that- of it. Or they yeah, sing that the, lewd song when they're uh, in the bar, right? About the uh, Inman's daughter, oh, yeah. right? Yep. Played by, who was it? 
Anita Eckberg? No, it wasn't Anita Eckberg. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. Um, it was uh, a. Um, Anita Pallenberg, maybe? I get confused. Oh, no, but Greg liked her. <laughs> <laughs> when she's like rubbing herself against the wall, I get where Greg is coming from. <laughs> yeah, she was pregnant at the time, too. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> so she, she refused to have them show her frontage. Uh, That's is why that it's why mostly she was shot from the, the bat. There you yeah. go. She's also a better performer than what's his name, Edward uh, Woodward. Woodward. He's a little hammy, you know, when he's oh, for the love of Christ. You know, I, li- he's, I like Edward. He's playing, Woodward, it, he's playing it a little heavy. <laughs> I like him. I, Greg I, has I a man crush on Equalizer, but <laughs> yes, on Christopher exactly. Lee too. Yeah, he has a man crush. Christopher Lee. Oh, I love Christopher Lee. I think. Yeah, I'm a. You're, you're not a fan, Karen, of Christopher Lee's. I Come think on. I don't know. He's just so mad all the time. Like he just looks. Like he's not enjoying himself. Yeah, he's not a good sport. Well, know, as when, as I've which, said in the podcast, Earl, as a child of the seventies, right? He's my Dracula. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a poster of Christopher Lee on my wall as that's a kid. Cool. I didn't have Bela Lugosi. I had Christopher <laughs> Lee because that's who was Dracula sure. at the time, right? Well, and since I'm way older you, than you, <laughs> would you concede that Peter Cushing is a better actor? Oh, I love Peter mm-hmm. Cushing. Yeah. <laughs> We just went on. We like, just, there's no concession. It's an absolute yeah, truth. Well, because we just <laughs> gushed about him last episode. Yeah, so it I hasn't love, come I out yet. Cushing. Yeah, I love Cushing. Like well, I think, he, like I said, I just think Christopher Lee just looks like he's not. He doesn't want to be there. I don't know how right. to describe it. Not he was very proud of detached. his performance in Witcher Man. Do you think his performance in Witcher Man is better than like? Yes. Britt Eklund. Britt Eklund. Britt Eklund. It just came I to me. It was, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Britt Eklund. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I think he hated the role of Dracula. It's, yeah. what, it's just the impression it gave me watching. Well, there's it. one of those Hammer films so, where he he ref, he would do it only if he could be mute, right? He refused yeah, he to, refused to speak the lines. Yeah, because he he hated the role so much. So I think but, at that yeah. point they might have been searching around for a new Dracula. I think. <laughs> have you yeah, heard any yeah. of Christopher Lee's metal? He recorded two uh, I might metal have. albums. Like I'm sure I have. I'm sure I he, have. He claimed to be related to Charlemagne, and so he made this like concept well, album he had his a, ancestor he did a lot in his life he was he was a busy guy <laughs> you know that. that story he tells about uh nazi hunting when he and then yep. using his experience on lord of the rings right yeah all that stuff <laughs> but going back to soundtracks yes yes listen to the goblin <laughs> soundtrack for suspiria because it's kind of nuts but kind of great and then so. sometimes you can see i mean reanimator has a really terrible soundtrack or it's a good soundtrack but it's psycho soundtrack it's, yeah, it's a, almost it's a complete fun, rip off of of Psycho yeah. soundtrack. I mean, it's almost lifted note for note. I'm surprised I got away with it, honestly. So I own two horror movie soundtracks. Three if you count Who Made Who, but that's totally different. That's a different <laughs> thing altogether. So one, The Omen. Hmm. That's a movie I haven't seen since 78 when it came oh out. Oh, my God. Something. It's been a long time. I love this soundtrack. I don't think Robin would like Omen very much. Either. No, no, I was too. He, he, I think. He well, he went on and on about the actors <laughs> from what I was reading about how it was like a big budget and they right. had all these actors. See, he didn't like the big budget ones. He liked the ones that nobody heard of. He was, he was trying to champion the, the sort of disreputable, but more politically and aesthetically progressive movies. And the other I soundtrack I have. It's a great one. That's a great soundtrack. Which, who wrote it? I, who, who was Mark I Corvin? I had neither, but something after I saw the movie, I had to buy the soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they would be different movies without the music, I think. Yes, right. I think the music is almost another character in, the, yes, in those films. So. In both of those films, I would agree. Particularly in The Witch, it's very brooding and, and it and it and it is is of a piece with what the movie is trying to achieve, which speaking of which, we were talking about De Palma before. I think my favorite De Palma film may be his musical. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Phantom of the Paradise, which is kind of a horror musical that calls on like gothic iconography, like, you know, like characters that look like they stepped out of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and stuff. And it's Paul Williams is the lead. Do you remember Paul Williams, mm-hmm. the, the little blonde guy who mm-hmm. used to appear on all the variety shows in the mm-hmm. 70s and 80s, the composer? Yep. And he plays and it's a rewrite of the Phantom of the Opera only. He's like a uh, like a glam rocker. It's kind of awesome. Mm. <laughs> We'll have to look that one up because we were not. I mean, it's, it's no, definitely well, we, a niche. The musical we watched was right. Anna and the Apocalypse, which is you... fun. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. fun. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. No, it was I... way better than I thought. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a movie that didn't get enough attention when it came out. That's, that's a fun little movie for sure. Yeah. It's too, it's, it's rare that, I mean, I live in a pretty small town. Boone is about 
twenty thousand, and then when school's out, and then doubles that. But we only have one theater in it. It's a regal theater, and since the chain just declared bankruptcy, it may not be around for long. We'll see, <laughs> I'm worried. That's but I went bummer. to the movies last weekend, and you know there were four people in the auditorium besides us. And it's like this is not good. Yeah, I haven't gone in a while. Was it Top yeah. Gun? It's been no, no, no. We saw uh, <laughs> Three Thousand Years of Longing, the new George Miller film. The guy who directed. Mad Max Fury Road. So mm. this is his new movie. It's very odd and it's not like Fury Road at all. It's about an academic who actually discovers a genie, a jinn, and it's Tilda Swinton and uh, Idris Elba in the movie. It's interesting. That's a Japanese thing, the jinn, isn't it? Is that right? No, it's I uh I think it's is it Japanese? Is it? I don't know. I'm not I sure. don't know. I can't I, I recognize it. I don't know my it. fairy tales very well. Yeah. I know a lot more about a <laughs> Dick Palma's Phantom of the Paradise than I do about fairy tales. Okay, so now if you were going to make a horror film, right? what genre would you pick? And would you put yourself oh. in it like Hitchcock does? No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> just looking at myself on the Zoom screen here gives me the willies. <laughs> I am no matinee idol, so, nor was Hitchcock. Well, he so. wasn't, no. No, no, it's true. I, I would. I'm a. I would totally put myself in there somewhere. I'd be eating in the really? dime. I don't know, but I That's would. That's cool. I get that. You you probably have a healthier self esteem than I do. No, because I know I'd only ever get to make one movie. So. <laughs> well, I mean, is that because your movie would be so esoteric or I think so it would just be bad. Or? I think I'd nah, be in there with nah. Ed Wood. No, no, no. <laughs> but what would you know. pick? Would you do zombies? Would you do what would you? I do like zombies, but I think in some ways the metaphor of the zombie is a little overdone now you know i mean the saturation of shows like the walking dead and it's right it's right. like i i i it's hard to be, it'd be hard to be original yeah, yeah yeah exactly and and not that i'm begrudging shows like that because i watched at least three or four seasons of walking dead but i just yeah it'd be hard to figure out something new to do i don't know i mean i do love hitchcock films i love those slow boils i would love to do something that would be a kind of art, surreal, horror kind of film, you know? I mean, I, I run hot and cold on David Lynch, but when I'm hot on him, it's because he's able to combine elements of narrative with things that are inexplicable and disturbing and uncanny, you know? I mean, watching something like Blue Velvet, it's got, you know, a narrative and you can follow it, but there are things that happen in there and you're not sure why they happen. And even the But they could knowing, happen. Yeah. They, you know, well, they're still, I mean... Well, but it, at the end, the guy has been lobotomized by a TV and he's hooked to the TV, but he's still moving. Just stuff that's not explained. That's almost like... You have questions when it's yes, over. <laughs> yes, and that's the most disturbing thing, yes. right, is that you have questions, right? And you don't have everything answered. So, Which is not the typical the approach of the typical Hollywood film that goes out of its way to explain things to I'd like to make a, a movie that would be a little artsy in that it preserves its uncanny mysteries a little bit. I'm not, I know that's not very specific, but. No, I'm just curious what, you know, with your knowledge and having seen so many films, kind of what. I think you, you may be overselling how many films I've seen. I haven't seen that many. Well, you've seen a lot <laughs> relative to you've us. You've seen a lot more than us. I yeah. can tell just by the names you're throwing out. <laughs> but, but that's the fun of it. I mean, we just, we started doing this podcast during the pandemic, like a lot of people did, because. I live in a high risk household, so I can't go out right. and do things. And, and you're two I hours had... away too for me, which yeah, we're... I know pains you terribly. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> yes, so we're... should be drinking in the same room. <laughs> yeah, well, and I—that's how I actually. No, said but it's I... an excuse to get together and have fun. No, that I makes texted sense. him and said I had a True Blood cookbook. Okay, because I watched <laughs> the HBO series, I loved it. Whatever, and I had it, right. and right. it had all these drink recipes in it, and I thought. Who do I know? <laughs> Who's enough of a lush that will participate? <laughs> yes, that would be willing to try a new drink with me, say every Saturday night, That's and then nice. somehow and it audio and well, build a website. We didn't, we didn't know how hard that part was going to be. Well, you were the one who said let's make it a podcast, and then we came around to watch movies because my mom loved those old movies, and you know it what's, reminds what's... me of her. What's been the nicest them. surprise for you in the movies that you've watched so far? What's been your favorite? Let's see, that's hard. Yeah, you favorite know, this, son. I don't mean to. The, sort of the biggest surprise anyone. was some. I think Anna and the Apocalypse was really good right. because okay. I was surprised okay. by how good it was, and I right. didn't know anything about it. 
Right, I hadn't right. even, you know. I agree. That's yeah. the best way to go in and see movies. You know, when I saw Reanimator, I just remember walking out going, what the hell was that? In a good way, though. <laughs> I think what also surprised us was watching, I'd never seen Bride of Frankenstein and how weird and bizarre and- And campy. Yeah, and not as good as we thought it was like going to be. Yeah. She doesn't show oh, up no, till the see, last I love that 10 movie, minutes. But- <laughs> <laughs> well, not, no, no, not as like, more, not good it's meaning like- it is campy. Like yeah. it's not- I don't know. It's I not expected, scary. It's not scary. Yeah. And I expected a better quality kind of, I don't know. It's just so weird with the little people and the. In the jars. Yeah. Yeah. In and the, the, the and what is this? And, you know. And See, so, I, I kind of like it just because it's so unusual. I mean, it doesn't do what Frankenstein did, which is to try to, you know, it doesn't have a scene in it like Frankenstein that carries any kind of moral gravitas, like the scene where he throws the girl in the water right i mean in bride of frankenstein you get the goofy scene with the bottles and you, you get the the prelude right where they're camping it up like she can frighten everybody i am lord byron all that stuff i, mean, mm-hmm. I can't i love that stuff but it's not horror it's not horror it's well, no it's, it, yes. it's very campy it's good but it's not when you go in you're expecting something completely yes, different. you are yes you are. and you walk and you finish it and you're thinking that is just so weird and I'm a Gilbert Gottfried fan, or was, I should say, since he's passed on. He used to do a routine about the Frankenstein movies in his act that I, is the funniest thing I ever heard. You know how at the end of that movie they say, no, don't pull the lever, you'll destroy the castle. And it's like, yeah, we had a lever installed, you know. Uh, you know, the guy said, we don't have to put a lever in, but we will. But every time I go in the laboratory, I have to be careful not to throw my coat on the lever. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 absurd. The movie is absurd, just on the basic like logic level of why the hell would you have a self destruct lever in your in your laboratory? But no, I mean, I get that. I mean, there have been classic movies that I've watched. I'm trying to think of a horror film that I've watched that I was really disappointed in. Some of the Dario Argento films, you know. I mean, I I, I Which remember are? watching uh, what. Well, I mean, he started in the genre known as giallo, which is the Italian word for yellow which are these suspense films that kind of veer over into horror territory. Not unlike later Hitchcock. Uh, the, the earliest one is called the bird with the crystal plumage. And it's, <laughs> and, and it's, it's pretty Does it great. Have subtitles. Uh, no, or, no, they're no? dubbed. Okay. They're like spaghetti uh, Westerns. They're dubbed, but he did a number of films. He did the animal trilogy that included also, what is it? Cat of nine tails and four flies on gray velvet. And then did Suspiria, did a number of films, but later, later, Argento gets kind of cruel for my taste. I mean, really bloody and mean and opera. Yeah, no, that those were some, some, they have their, they have their fans, but I'm not one of them, but, but you should see some Argento if you can stomach it. Cause watch the earlier films and it's not too bad. Plus if you're a soundtrack fan, you're either going to love or hate the soundtrack to Suspiria, which is just this oh, throughout the entire film. It's kind of like shrieking that, I don't know if it's great or if it's nuts. I can't decide. You have to decide for me since you're more sensitive about soundtracks, you guys. Back in January, we did a whole month of werewolf films. Right, right. Um, and I'm trying to werewolf remember, of you... London. I really that liked. was yeah, that was a good surprise. Yeah, we both liked that one way more than we thought. Even we like would. the later Universal right. Wolfman right. and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you watch the Hammer one with uh, Oliver Reed? We just we did just that a couple weeks Hammer. ago. Okay. What do you think of that? It was okay. <laughs> okay. It was okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of the way I feel about it. I like Oliver Reed. I do too. And yeah, but yeah, we both like. Yeah. But he didn't. He was. I he thought I was watching the, the wrong movie for the first yeah, thirty for minutes. For the first half, she was like, "Am I, I watching the right movie?" <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, no, but I yeah, get that. he was he was good. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, we've had a lot of. Pleasant surprises. Ready or not, of... I really liked, which is a new yeah, one. Yeah, I liked that. We, we saw that did. in the theater. And I, I, we made the mistake of, I made the mistake of taking my wife because she thought it was just too much. But, <laughs> but I, yeah, no, I found it. It was fun to watch. I wasn't bored. It was fun. What I would have liked of... it better if she was more of a badass, like the <laughs> like the poster showed. Her She's pretty the... badass at the I end. Thought you know, so. I know. I thought... blood and stuff. Yeah, like, funny badass. But it looks like she's got weapons, you know, <laughs> looking at the Poor poster, weapons. it looks like she's got weapons and she's like hunting these people down, but it's really right, not right. that at all. No, she's just trying to survive, right? right. And get the hell out, right? But, <laughs> but that makes more rational sense. I mean, for her to turn metamorphose into a cold-blooded killer over the space of one night would be probably asking too much. But, but yeah, I like that movie. What did you think of, did you see the new Doctor Strange film? 
Not yet, no. I'm asking because it was directed by Sam Raimi. And, you know, I mean. And that's and Marvel. I, We're talking Marvel now, correct, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. And it was, you know, so given the fact that you've seen, you know, Evil Dead and maybe some of the other ones like Drag Me to Hell. I don't know if you've seen that. But mm-hmm. but he kind of, he's pretty good with the horror. And they, they try to introduce horror elements in it. Too. There's this whole thing where Doctor Strange is reanimated from the dead in it and stuff. And it's. It's kind of interesting, but I feel as if the Marvel movies themselves have such a powerful formula that even a director like Sam Guarini gets lost in it, you know, which is too bad. I'm a DC guy. Uh, ha, ha. <laughs> I, I, I'm more of a Marvel guy, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, All right. So we have conflict. So come back to <laughs> Universal versus <laughs> Hammer, Hammer films. Yeah. Greg is Uh-oh. a big Hammer guy and I am right. Universal. I like the old one. Like you're older, Karen. It is. I'm way older. <laughs> I guess I like more Hammer films, but I don't know if that's because Hammer made more films or not. But the later Universals get pretty dire, you know. I mean, after Son of Frankenstein, it's a pretty dead loss, I think. I like Son of Frankenstein. And they are better. slower. There's no they question. Slower. Very you know? theatrical. I did yes. not teach, you'll notice on the syllabus, conspicuous by its absence was the original Lugosi Dracula. And I felt bad about that, but at the same time, I've taught it before, and it moves very slowly and very theatrical. Have you ever thought about doing the Spanish version? I have not. I should do that. I, I, I you know, because I hear lots of people say that's read. a better film, even though yeah, it's yeah. a shot for shot almost right, on the right. same sets and everything. There's a bunch of stuff that I can't squeeze in, but that would be fun to try. But, but then, then again, you know, I mean, I showed them some footage from Lugosi just so they know who Lugosi was, but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the other person who, who got edged out there that we talked about a little bit in class, but we didn't watch a full film by was Browning, which I think was a mistake in retrospect. I think I, I wish I'd taught either Freaks or The Unknown, which is probably one of the creepiest films I've ever seen. So The Unknown in particular. Yeah, The Unknown. Uh, that's, right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's to do with the arms. The and, arms. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And the laughter. <laughs> The, the, Great. What's his that's going to be. We on may our we list may get now. to it, Karen. Thanks, we may, Craig. We may get. To it. It's short. It's like sixty five minutes, but it is a twisted sixty five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's twisted. Yeah, yeah. It's tragic and twisted. So that scene where he things, starts laughing at Joan Crawford. Oh my God! How long have you been at Appalachian State? I've been here since ninety eight, so I guess twenty four years. And then before that, I was in grad school, and I taught while I was in grad school. So this is my thirty eighth year of teaching. Ugh. And so you approached you approach the English department right. and you're like, hey, I got That's, this new idea. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. You, you said they gave you freedom in the genre class, they did. but they did. did you get any any blowback at all or were because no. I bet it like you said, I, it's a popular class. It's It's interesting because when I first got here, we had two film classes on the books and I was hired to add more classes and to flesh out a, a full like film concentration or film minor. And so we added four class and one of them was the, the genres class, you know. Uh, so we is have other... that your major? What was your major? Oh, I was in the English department, but I worked with, uh, this is a funny story. I worked with a guy named Bob Carringer at the University of Illinois. He was my dissertation director, the book I had to write to get my PhD. He was the one of the world's big Orson Welles scholars. And when he was researching his book, The Making of Citizen Kane, he- Red Bud. Red bud. Rose Rose bud. bud. Rose bud. Rose bud. Rose bud. Red bud. <laughs> That's how too much I know. <laughs> well, it's funny you should mention that because when he was researching it out in, in Hollywood, I don't know if I should say this on the podcast. I don't know if it's secret or whatever. <laughs> he found uh, that there were still some props and such like that from RKO, which made Citizen Kane, in storage. And he got there as they were sort of just throwing the stuff out. And he found the last surviving intact rosebud, <gasps> like the actual sled. Wow. And then a couple of years later, sold it to Steven Spielberg for $71,000. Nice. And they just gave him the sled. They didn't know what it was worth. They're like, sure, you can have it. They made they made three. They burned two at the end of the movie. And then he got the last one. Lucky Bob. <laughs> so you just, so you had his influence and the fact that you liked films. Yeah. Yeah. As your, you know. I did not take a film class until I went to grad school. I, there were a number of filmmakers at UB, at the University of Buffalo, but I never took classes with them because I didn't know that you could take classes with them. And I feel bad about that. I mean, experimental filmmakers, guys I would have loved to have met, but I was just, you know, working my job at Sunshine Supermarket on Hurl Avenue and then going to class. And, 
staying afloat, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, good Do you remember hurdle. Sunshines? Do you remember No, but Sunshine? I remember Hurdle. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right around the corner from Parkside, so it's right around Anita's nice. place. So yep. Yeah. Hurdle but, Avenue is happening, Greg. There you go. That's I And I saw Hurdle Avenue. That's where the North Park Theater is, and that's where I saw Willard. So that was one of the things that... And the Sinbad movies of the mid-70s. Oh, remember? God, those, like, Sinbad yes. Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger and stuff like that. So that got me interested in weird film. So that was cool. My mom took us to the drive-ins to see those mm. and they were so dark. You couldn't see anything. Yeah. You know, I, so you could sort of see all I remember is there was a witch that tried to transform back and from a bird <laughs> and her foot didn't. Yeah. 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 I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was like, a, she had a claw foot. And stuff. Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> I remember going with my parents to see beneath the planet of the apes at the drive-in. We and, you know, the whole two. nuclear like, Armageddon thing at the end freaked me out as a kid. I was just like, you know, I spent years after that thinking, you know, the world's going to explode now. Who cares? You know, we're all dead. You know? See, <laughs> that film changed you. That That's movie. what yeah, I, I talked about did. earlier. I guess it did. Though it not for the better. Your... It depressed the hell out of me. Yeah, but it changed your behavior. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. It depressed me. It made me mope around thinking we're all going to die in nuclear holocaust. I want to get back to Universal and Hammer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think I think there are more Hammer films than I like than Universal. Just because I think the Universal films like there are movies You think they're because they're in color? It doesn't Hammer hurt, films? I guess. It doesn't hurt, although that's not a deal breaker for me. I guess it doesn't just... sound like anything's a deal breaker for you. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean... Given all the crap I watch, that's right. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, I think I think the I mean bloodier. I mentioned... I mentioned in the email that I think the the Devil Rides Out is a great film. I love it, and it's oh, Christopher Lee's goodness, best Karen. performance. Hang in there, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Hang in there for it. He's a good guy. Hang in there. Oh, he's it. a great guy. So no, I mean, like Lee, a character but... is a good guy, like a hero oh, and a cult good. hero. But you know, I mean, I don't know. There's something trashy and fun about Hammer that I <laughs> the Universals sometimes they're just trashy. It's funny you say trashy. Later. So can you compare like? Earlier, early Hammer to later Hammer, because I feel like '60s Hammer was right. pretty, it's straight, pretty straightforward, a retelling almost of Universal's stories or whatever, right? Near the end of the decade, they start to get a little, you know. And in '70s, we get a little trashier, right? We, and we have the Hammer and, Girls. And, yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the difference between those films is, you know, you start with the Curse of Frankenstein and you end with something like the Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which i love but it ain't it ain't horror dracula or curse frankenstein right <laughs> i yes. remember going to dallas when that movie was rare when legend of the seven golden vampires was rare and a friend of mine found it for me and she's like we're gonna watch something tonight that you've wanted to see and then it's like oh man shaw brothers hammer co-production kung fu vampires i'm all over this <laughs> So, <laughs> well, we haven't watched it yet, but we have the vampire lovers coming up. There you go. There you go. And then Captain Kronos, vampire hunter, and all that stuff. Oh, I mean, that, that's that could, stuff's that'd be, could be coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> Karen, you have this look on your face like, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> In the meantime, no universals to watch, huh? No. You got to, no. you got to, you got to assert yourself here. But even those were Hammer, Hammer films distributed by Universal. Yeah, but right? I mean, but, yeah. And, and and Hammer was just at that point throwing stuff against the wall, trying to survive. You know, I mean, little. So what knowing, about newer Hammer? I have not seen Hammer past its seventy mid seventies, uh, yeah, being days. I mean, what what would what would count as new? So Hammer? you didn't. Okay, so the last Hammer film I saw was The Woman in Black. Oh, that's the one with. Uh, Daniel Rad, What's yeah, Daniel, Daniel Radcliffe. Rad. Yeah. I did not see it, so I can't, I can't opine. It's pretty good. It. That's cool. That's I cool. thought it was anyway. So, I would have, if I had been him, I would have worked just to say I made a Hammer horror film. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, I, would, I would see it if I were you. The last horror film I saw in the theater was <laughs> X, the Ty West movie about the people shooting a porn film at a farm where the, oh, these old people mm. start killing them off. That was kind of fun. <laughs> I went to Athens. <laughs> I saw. I remember seeing the previews for that. Yeah, I went to <laughs> Athens, Georgia on like a two day just field trip during my sabbatical. And I saw that there it was, you know, I saw it by myself. It was one of the first movies I saw in a theater since the pandemic. And it was maybe that's made me predisposed to like it. You know, wow, I'm yeah. in the movie theater again. Yay. But, yay. Finally. So popcorn. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's one I teach, but I sure had a good time watching it, getting creeped out. Although in that movie. 
there's a scene and the spoiler alert where this woman is hiding from these homicidal old people and she hides under their bed under and then the two of them start having sex and they have this disgusting old age makeup. And I'm like, should I be resentful that the true horror in this movie is aging? <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Define old. Yeah, right. right exactly. Because what, what are you talking like they about? They look like in their 80s or something. Oh, okay, and the old okay. age makeup has warts. And, you know, I mean, they're just designed to look hideous. So, but, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the idea of anyone over the age of 30 having sex is horrific, you know? I mean, yes. Wait a second. I'm, I'm, I, I take a section. I take exception to that. I don't yes. think that's nice. <laughs> and I guess so, there's going to be a prequel to that movie. So I guess it was successful. They can all have prequels, but they can't all have sequels. What are you, you know? thinking of? No, I'm just because I just like a good sequel. It's just oh, something okay. I said at the end. Yeah. So we watched Hell House. Okay. And then we both were like, Legend oh, of Hell House. Yeah. Sorry, Legend of Hell House. Right. And there's obviously a book. Right. That that was made off, or, or Rosemary's Baby, or sure, whatever. Do sure. you ever do you read horror, or do you limit yourself to? I, I do I, read horror. I and, mean, you read some... you read academic horror about oh, sure, horror, sure, sure. but do you, but you do read horror also. I taught a class maybe five or six years ago on H.P. Lovecraft, and so I, I damn been... it. What's the matter? What I want to go what? to these classes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, he's hard for me to read. Class personally he is he is he's he's his ideas <laughs> i've are tried in prose i mean and, and he's a complicated figure to teach in this day and age because he's such a xenophobe right he's racist he's sexist yeah. he's anti-semitic he's a mess but one of the reasons why i wanted to teach him is to talk is to confront that you know his right. xenophobia to confront his prejudices directly but also talk about why he endures despite you know the difficulty of his prose and 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 the fact that he was in some ways well Individually, I think he was a nice person, but his beliefs were pretty poisonous. And we talked about that. We and we read, you know, the stories with their prejudices intact to sort of process that eternal question you have these days. You know, it's like, can you separate the art from the artist? And you know, I think the answer is going to be different for everyone. But but yeah, it's, it was interesting to talk about. But the second half of the class, we read a number of contemporary novels, sometimes written by women, people of color, that kind of play within Lovecraft's universe, the, the the mythos, and and tweaks it so so that it, it challenges his racism and his prejudice. Right. So I'm thinking of Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff was one that we read in that class. Victor Laval's The Ballad of Black Tom, which takes the point of view of a blues singer in a party that's written about in the horror at Red Hook by H.P. Lovecraft. Stories by Joanna Russ and other feminist writers that actually sort of confront what I think was pretty clearly Lovecraft's fear of women. I mean, he just, you know, was it, what was it? Uh, was it Stephen King who said there's no sex in Lovecraft, which means of course that it's all about sex, <laughs> you, know, <it's> just, <laughs> you know, you know, all this gaping maws and tentacles. There's this kind of weird fear of just That's a pretty cool monstrous thing feminine, to, you know, to write a book about something that happened in another book. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, that, you know, people will know because mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. Yeah. A I mean, cult that, following exactly. Kind of I mean, I've always wanted to read the book March, which is the a book about what happened to the March family's dad when he fought in the Civil War. You know, as a compliment to uh, Little Women. You know, <laughs> I don't know why that's the first example that popped into my head when we're on a horror film podcast. Well, we're talking about Hell House, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> But yeah, so I'll read horror often for my classes and sometimes for pleasure. I read a lot of horror comics. I don't know if that sort of intersects with you guys, what you guys are interested in, like the EC comics of the 50s. I teach those in a comic book class that I teach. Yes, another class you might want to take. <laughs> uh, the Warren Black and White magazines. Warren was the publisher of Famous Monsters of Filmland, but it also published oversized black and white comic books that that told horror stories, sometimes adapting Poe and Lovecraft into comics form. And then there's a whole bunch of contemporary horror artists. There's a guy named Josh Simmons who does horror comics that I think probably disturb me that more than any film that I've seen. I mean, his book, The Furry Trap, is like, oh my God. <laughs> it's it's really hard to read. And then so there's you, even Japanese in... artists. I mean, like Junji Ito, who did Uzumaki and Kyo. I mean, he writes some really creepy horror comics. Oh, great. I love them. Your love of comics coincides with your love of film since you were younger, since you were young. Uh, I've been I've been in love with 
all kinds of media since my three obsessions in my life culturally have been punk rock music, film, especially the genres that I like, like horror and uh, comics. Yeah. So when I say I teach in the English department, it's like, what do you teach? Uh, film and comics. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Which is, or as my dad once said, you mean you sit around all day, talk about film and comics, and you get paid for it? <laughs> Which there is some truth. That's in the, that. <laughs> that's the sweet spot right there. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, there are committee meetings that I'm not crazy yeah. about. You guys are great okay. papers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can put up with it, so I can get so I can go into class tomorrow and talk about you know Harold Lloyd or something. I think I'm doing my intro class tomorrow. I don't think we covered this, but what do you hope your students take away from your class? Well, I mean, they have to write papers, so I hope they get practice <laughs> at getting better at analyzing text through their own writing. I mean, that's what a, that's what I have in common with other English classes, I think. Basically, what we study in English classes is a pretext for people to practice their own writing and their own communication, and I think that's important. But I also want them to realize that popular culture is more complicated than they think it is. You know, I mean, I think there is a tendency to think of horror films as being, like, just horror films, but... There are things going on there, you know, there are things underneath the surface. There's a lot of craft that goes into making these movies, too. And I think I think when they're done with the class, they appreciate the fact that horror films aren't just there to scare them. Or if they're there to scare them, they scare them in different ways that they don't expect, you know, or or they take them places that they didn't expect. So, Do you think some of that's subliminal when you watch a horror film that you absorb those ideas without really knowing until I was reading the essays in the book? on psycho is like well crap i didn't you know i didn't <laughs> right, really right. see that i missed yeah. that you know so or you, you just do... had a different response right or you were watching it for a different reason but in this class you know i kind of push them to be more rigorous in the way that they watch a film but there's nothing wrong with watching a film just because you want a good scare you know i mean but there's more there and i i guess that if they take away anything it would be if i applied myself and thought about this movie a little bit more i might get more out of it if they walk away with that i'm happy it's almost like pay attention yeah to the media yeah. around you yeah. and analyze yeah. what you're seeing instead of just taking it yeah at face exactly value. exactly be a critical yeah. thinker that's the yes. phrase that's used over and over again and and by critical i don't mean sit there and evaluate it in terms of i like that or i didn't like right it, but more a sort of like well, what is it doing how does it operate how does it function or how is it affecting how me? is it built how yeah. is it affecting you how is how what is it is it taking ideas in popular culture or even in political culture and transforming it into a metaphor you know I mean, how was it Romero reflecting was society's fears at the time it was made yeah yeah and and you know i mean you can watch <laughs> you can watch a lot of films by made by cronenberg and other people and think oh my god you know this idea of uh you know pandemic you know you know, both well, it prefigures yeah. this, the, the spread of AIDS, it prefigures all kinds of things. It prefigures COVID-19. I mean, it, we have our own fears about our bodies, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. When as much as complicated we, stuff. We're, we were just talking about or the brain that wouldn't die. I did a little bit of research about because I, I had a feeling it had a little bit to do with the God complex, you know, mm -hmm. the, right. and transplantation had just come out, mm -hmm. you know, in medical science and so it was just like wow i wonder if this is some sort of comment like on, metaphor about it yeah, yeah that yeah. oh we shouldn't be messing with this that's you know? right that's right we don't need to be putting pig valves in our hearts or else. right or, or you know it's so it was watching films like that sometimes you you can see or the fear of radiation or because yeah, yeah. radiation we just not to admit it but we just watched chud <laughs> So that radiation on those people, you know, right. had one effect. But if you're the Hulk, you and you're irradiated. See, that's just it. When I was reading comics as a kid, I prayed to be irradiated. Right. Yeah. Because Spider Man. Superpowers. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, you know, every single Marvel hero, Daredevil, Spider Man, um, the Hulk, the Fantastic Four, they all got their powers by getting hit by cosmic rays or gamma rays or something. So as a kid, I was like, boy, if I could only walk across the street and then be hit in the eyes with a radioactive isotope like Daredevil, I could have all these abilities. <laughs> so I wasn't afraid of radiation. I, mean, I was afraid of nuclear war, but I thought uh, other kind of radiation, the ones that would turn me into a superhero would be awesome. <laughs> but it's just different. It's funny to see that dichotomy right. of you could either go and have yeah. your face melted off or that's hey, right. that's you right. could be that's this right. wonderful superhero, depending or, on. Or sometimes know. they combine, right? Like the thing in the Fantastic Four. He's the guy, a guy with the, made of orange rocks. 
he was a superhero and he did the right thing and he defeated villains and fought for truth, justice in the American way, but he was also a monster yep. and never got over being a monster. Well, they're all kind of monsters. Yeah. Yeah. I but mean, I mean, if you're Spider-Man, really... at least you can pass as a normal human being. You can if you're made of orange rocks. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> that was my idea of pathos yeah. as a child. Oh, poor Ben Grimm. Can't That's right. You look in the mirror every day and it's like, oh, I'm hideous. That's right. That's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Some of us do that <laughs> right, anyway. Exactly. Like, it doesn't have to be. I do that when I'm getting ready to teach and I think, yeah, reverse rain gray. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hairline recedes just a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the one horror film you think everyone should see and why? A few times ago when I taught the horror film class, I taught a film at the end right before Thanksgiving called The Sun. It's a film made by Belgian filmmakers, the Dardenne brothers. And it, it features a character who's a father who has to confront the ultimate horror and forgive what happened to him. I thought it was a really interesting film in the sense that, I mean, I, I don't want to give away too much about it. But the sun as in? S-O-N. That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> right. And, and what it is, is it's all, it basically is a movie that takes you to the, probably the most horrific place that somebody can go and then says, and you have to learn to forgive the person who inflicted this on you. And it's really, really interesting. It's re you're like, nope, uh, nope. You know, I'd have a problem with it already. I can tell. <laughs> you're sitting there going, I want those weapons. <laughs> That's right. I'm not good at forgiving. <laughs> but I mean, there's a whole, there's whole genres of the horror film that sort of insist that if you try to, if you try to get vengeance, then, you know, you just descend yourself. You've to the turned into the monster. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking so. of the rape revenge films that are so common in the eighties and seventies and eighties, right? I spit on your grave, Ms. 45. The women who do the revenge don't find any catharsis. They they kill the people who abuse them, and then they're still victims of trauma. It doesn't make things yeah, better. Yeah, they still you know? have the trauma that goes right. with it. Yeah, exactly. And so they have to yeah, feel I a little bit better, <laughs> <laughs> don't they? I, I just I just know that at the end of I, I spit on your grave. She ain't smiling, and she drowns her her last abuser. So so in Ms. Forty Five, she kind of loses her mind and goes to a party, dresses a nun, starts shooting people down. You know? <laughs> but that movie is really interesting in that it takes, it's almost like Pet Cemetery, which it deals with the same kind of trauma in Pet Cemetery about mm. losing a child. And then it's like, where do you go when you have to confront such a horror that happens in real life? It's really powerful. And it, it really is. It also sort of hints at redemption, even Christian redemption with a name like The Sun, right? Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting sort of meditation on what do you do when you're trying to process the ultimate horror. I love Greg, it. maybe I'm putting that on my list. I love it. I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> Greg will what? be emailing you. Damn it, Greg. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No revenge. Thanks a lot, pal. <laughs> what film did we just watch, Karen, where it talked about Pet Cemetery is kind of a retelling of it and the monkey's paw. That's what it was. Oh, that's a, is that a Carpenter film? No, we watched an old oh. one. There are oh, so okay, many of okay. them. No, that's um, Monkey Shines, I'm thinking of. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Monkey's yeah. Paul, where you get a wish. And yeah. That's kind of what that don't turn out good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still remember uh, there's a Simpsons episode, a Treehouse of Horror episode, where they get the Monkey's Paw and, and Homer, you know, is getting all these wishes and they're turning on him. And he's like, okay, I'm going to make a wish. And I, <laughs> I just want to, I just want a tuna fish sandwich. I don't want it to be zombie tuna fish. I don't want, he's listing right. all these conditions. And he goes, okay. And then he bites it. And he's like, it's a little dry. It's a little dry. <laughs> <He starts screaming>. <laughs> <laughs> but that movie that I just saw, that George Miller film, that 3000 years of longing is exactly that. It's like this genie comes out of a bottle played by Idris Elba hmm. and says to Tilda Swinton, three wishes and sets Care. conditions. Like, Careful what you wish for. Yeah. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting ex exploration of that. I think it's, it's, it's not what I expected it to be. It's not monkey pawish, luckily. So monkey pawish is that a subgenre? If it you say now. so, you're the you're the, you're the doctor. It is now. <laughs> That's right. Write a whole book on the monkey pawish genre. Sure. <laughs> it's been redone many times. <laughs> it has. It has. <laughs> so there's something appealing about it, but there's also this kind of cautionary tale of nobody can get what they really wish for, or yeah. if they get what they wish for, they discovered what are the consequences really for it at all? Yeah. yeah, or it affects someone else. It's yeah. too much yeah. power, right? It's the right. Right. myth. It's too much. You're playing God. We almost covered everything, I think. Cool. But you didn't yeah, get to your bit. women and minorities represented. We did that too. 
A little bit. We talked about that. I remember being at a a cinema studies conference where a friend of mine whose whose father was black and her mother is Korean. She gave a paper once called, what if the black guy in horror films survived into the final reel? <laughs> like, you know, well, he doesn't, sort of dream, he doesn't. I living there. That's, that's true. That's no, but then, <laughs> I think that's on- the last, the last maybe two minutes is kind of puts the, kind <laughs> he's of puts the last the, uh, dude, right? Yeah. Yeah. He is. And he's the hero. I mean, actually the, that's one of the interesting things about George Romero is he's very progressive about race. He always puts a strong black protagonist in there. I mean, even in Dawn of the Dead, right. It's like Ken Forey's character is the one who is, I think, unabashedly the competent and uh, likable hero in that movie, without a doubt. Yeah. He's, he's pretty good about that. I like that. We can kind of end with, one question Mm -hmm. and it might be too hard to answer but (laughs) if you had to pick one person who do you think has influenced the horror genre the most well romero would be a a logical person to say because the popularity of the zombie genre in a way that we haven't seen i mean so many spinoffs so many adaptations so many it's still um, going it's still going it's yeah uh, there's spinoffs of the walking dead the walking dead is in but now there's but where are the walking dead and you know, grandson of the Walking Dead. I don't know how many there are there. Anymore. I've lost so, track. is there a book about zo- where does that come from? The zombie genre is somebody just think it up and put it in the movies, or is there a well, book? Well, one that's- of the things that that Robin Wood argues, and this is really interesting, is that the first zombie movie that's kind of set the template for the end of the world is the birds. Mm. It's just birds instead of zombies, but it's still these in, this implacable natural force that suddenly turns on human beings, and it, right down to putting the the planks over the door so the birds can't get in is repeated only with zombies and the living dead. So in some ways you could argue that I think Hitchcock's the birds kind of prefigures that kind of apocalyptic way of looking at the world that manifests itself through, through later zombie films. I think Wood is onto something there. Hmm. That's so, interesting. Yeah. I mean, previously zombies were treated as kind of like one-offs rather than sort of herd animals that would attack. Right. I mean, I'm thinking of Val Luton's absolutely beautiful film kind of a horror film kind of not i walked with a zombie which is great it's an amazing film i there's i think a it lot might be about syllabus. that in his book it's yeah <laughs> and, yeah there sure is you're right there's like two long articles about i walked with a zombie <laughs> and again and that's one of the re- i love that movie so i was happy to teach it and have him read what about, uh, about i walked with a zombie but i think it's great but it's not it would be unrecognizable from the sort of zombies that we have in either uh, is it more Zach like Snyder's the- version of the Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead or things like that. It's just completely different now. Completely More like different. maybe the voodoo. Like yeah, it's written. very connected with voodoo there. Yeah. Because but they would raise the, the zombie for one specific right. purpose. Uh-huh. Not yeah, like or, or to be slaves in the sugar cane fields or something yeah. like that. That's kind of what Serpent I want. Serpent and the Rainbow. Yeah, yeah. That's Is that Carpenter? That is Carpenter, isn't it? I no, it's Wes Craven. Craven. You're yeah. right. It is Wes Craven. That's right. That's right. Again, another movie I haven't seen when it came out like in the late 80s or something. It's Me been too. a while. <laughs> but but I mean but they but, but the, it freaked really, me out, <laughs> especially that scene when he's sticking the needle in the eye. Yeah. yeah. Ah. <laughs> Wait, they, what's they, that they, one? He what is serpent, serpent, in, the serpent in the rainbow? Yeah. Is that um, had Bill Pullman in it or something? What or something? I think it does. Yeah, I think you're right. Very good. Wow, I don't remember hardly anything about it. I remember the eye scene, but those are hard to forget. <laughs> There's a whole chapter in Carol Culver's book, you know, where she ta- where she talks about identifying with the final girl is one of the chapters. And her book is, I'd recommend it. There's one, oh, there's a whole chapter about eyes and what it means to look. And, because often eyes are this kind of vulnerable organ. So on the one hand, when you're a voyeur, you're kind of controlling the gaze and you're getting to look at in the De Palma films at women that you want to eroticize or whatever. But on the other hand, if you've ever seen a movie like Peeping Tom, let's say, the eye and that kind of voyeuristic stance is undercut and, and sometimes literally <laughs> undercut. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it, it gets interesting. I mean, I think the, the voyeurism is not just power going one way. It's, 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 it's the voyeur is often in a vulnerable position to often to their own fantasies. It's interesting. Have you seen Peeping Tom? It's kind of amazing. Came out in 1960, the same year as a uh, Hitchcock psycho came out. But Hitchcock Psycho enhanced his reputation and turned him into, you know, America's greatest director. And this guy, Michael Powell, directed, and even though he had directed a number of really esteemed films in the 40s and 50s, people thought it was degenerate, disgusting, horrible. It ruined his career, completely ruined his career. Yeah, so, I've looked I've looked at it as a possible film for us to do, yeah. but 
That's one reason I know it. Yeah, it's 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 pretty astonishing. <laughs> I mean, it basically comes out of trauma. The and guy, I have like, a thing about eyes, so if it's got something to do with yeah, eyes, yeah, yeah. I don't want to watch it's, it. <laughs> it opens. The first shot is this guy, his eye opening, and you hear this swing on the soundtrack, like a little like harp string plucked, you know. It's, it's all about the eye, the vulnerabilities of the eye, what it means to look. Yeah. It's yeah. very powerful. Oh, wait, Greg, you wouldn't like that? What's it no, called? No, I peeping wouldn't like that. Tom. Peeping Tom. The peeping Tom, Karen. I know how you love peepers. Yeah. <laughs> That we argue over whether they're really peeping or not. <laughs> and they always are. Always. <laughs> I don't understand where you're oh. missing it, but whatever. <laughs> I like it a lot. But no, just getting back to I Walked With a Zombie, it's 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 fantastic. And, and one of the things that it deals with in a way that no other B-movie of the 40s deals with is the slave trade. And the lingering horrors of the slave trade in a way that it's kind of, I mean, I... I Val Luton's films, the short films he makes at RKO in the 40s are that he produces are pretty awesome. He only does Cat People. Um, we did that. We did that. And mm-hmm. that's a really interesting film. I mean, the first jump scare people seem to think is that one with the bus, right? When she's running away and right. then, ah, the bus pulls up and that's people say, you know, they used to call it in the trades, the Luton bus. You know, filmmakers named it after Luton. <laughs> that was great. a good film. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. film. Yeah, it's, he's 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 a great producer and worked with some great directors. Anyway, sorry to rave about Val Luton. I could do that all night and bore the hell out of you if I did it. <laughs> but I, my my students do not like Luton. He's not enough of horror for them. It's too a little too atmospheric, a little bit too genteel. They like the well, but they, they like need the, to understand. You have to stuff. ease into it. You can't yeah. just go because the right, one right. director you were just talking about it ruined his career. He was too yeah. early. You know, you have to you may yeah. take baby steps to get to the to where you want well, to go. Well, the British film industry has always been more cautious, maybe than. Although I was going to say they didn't accept Hitchcock, but actually Hitchcock came to America not because they didn't accept him, because he wanted more money. <laughs> he <laughs> was doing do fine it. in Britain. He was doing fine in Britain. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, this was for fun. Coming this on. was fun. I hope it wasn't too scatter shot, but. I or would, I didn't you know go into I'd, professor voice too often. So what I'd like to do is do another one in a year so we can take <laughs> everything you've said and start to apply it when we watch movies, well, because I mean, it's, you know, we're for entertainment purposes only. Sure, and we sure. have a good time watching the movies and a, a lot of them we haven't seen before. And it's but hard see, to en- entertainment double- purposes only is a phrase I think I object to. <laughs> because because it's not just only entertainment because no, it's we're obviously significant to your lives, right? Well, yeah, it Bud is. Bud has teased me about what do you spend your life studying movies and stuff, and I'm like, how much TV do you watch? Right. And there's a significant portion of your life where you watch TV, where you watch a movie, and it's not just entertainment; it's part of your life. It becomes part of who you are. Well, that's it changes not, your that's behavior not sometimes. Sneeze at. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know? Or it teaches you something different, or it entertains you in a way that you didn't expect to be entertained. It introduces you to new worlds. I mean, it can it can do all kinds of stuff. I so do actually. Purposes only. It's not I, an only. It's. I do quiz Greg. We come up. With, he'll <laughs> ask me about what what cars are in the movies and how much they cost, and I'll yeah, ask I'd be in him, trouble there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm terrible, terrible. But like terrible. when they say you would get five thousand dollars for something, we look up and say, "How much is that?" And, the, and <laughs> you know, today and that's stuff right, like that. Right. So we do little things like little yeah. things like we that. We learned all yeah. about Hans Gre- Geiger last week. Who made the Geiger, oh, the Geiger counter. counter guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. All those radiation films. Yeah. 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 And what and a normal smelling count salts. is. Well, and they shape who we are, you know, in all kinds of ways, as you say, consciously and subconsciously. I mean, I mean, I, I feel like a different person having discovered certain media and certain artists. I mean, I owe them a debt of gratitude. It's true. You know? Jack Kirby, who I'm working on that book right now and writing an essay for that book and co-editing it with my friends, he's probably the most important influence on my life besides my family. You know, I mean, he was the true, and don't get me started on this, but he's the real sort of beating heart of the Marvel characters. And I read all those comics in the 60s. I say don't get me started because he's much more important to Marvel than Stan Lee. You know, I mean, I learned so much from him. I mean, you know, and all of it, I think, not all of it, but most of it was positive. You know, it's a huge influence on my life. I say entertainment purposes, and that's important. Entertainment is important. So it's well, and you know, Greg and I have learned a lot about each other, too. Yeah. So 
<laughs> I, I, some of my best memories are dragging my friends to weird art films or horror films and then talking about them. You know, I mean, it's, it's a pretext to, to have discussions, to build friendships. Oh yeah. No, I, I'm a big fan of entertainment <laughs> beyond just only entertainment. Cause I'm, I think it's always going beyond that. It's true. Yeah. I stand corrected. I'm sorry. I don't mean to sound like no, a no, no. I'm just I'll kidding. beat you about it for the next 10 minutes, but <laughs> I think what you do is important to talk about why you like these films. I think, you know, you, you learn more about yourself and you share that with your listeners. I think that's cool. Well, on that note, please share it with your friends. And <laughs> I, will, I will. You can tell Anita and Bud they had a shout out. That's right. That's right. I said, shout outs. I actually asked her, Anita is my cousin, like, like right. we said, what do you think started him in horror films? And she said, I think he just liked to scare his mom. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> no, her she take. was the one who want, was making me watch Psycho. <laughs> so, I, yeah, well, that seems opposite to me. So I don't right. know if that was later that you were I mean, trying to do. I mean, every once in a while I do. I mean, I remember putting cigarette loads in her cigarettes. Do you remember those things? Those little, like when you light it and they explode. I think I did that because I didn't want her to smoke. So. And she would get scared by those, but. That might have been but you weren't like ever. hiding around the corner with masks or occasionally, like but not. Seriously. Oh, occasionally. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> and right. she liked being scared. She liked horror films. I remember going with her to see Halloween and she really she got into it. Yeah. She was funny because she really felt um, that kind of, you know, a physical physiological response to horror films. So every time there was jump scares, well, she probably was a babysitter. She, she would go like this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. That's right. Which is not a good thing to be in a horror film. No. But she would sit there at the jump scares in, in Halloween and she would literally like do this kind of guttural, like her air leaving her body, like, oh, every time there was a jump scare. And after a while, everybody around us in the theater is laughing every time she does it. And of course, I'm 15 years old. And I'm like, mom, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> embarrassed, embarrassed by her grunting. Well, but I but I remember that story now with incredible fondness, partially because she took me and she was willing to watch these movies and she liked them, too. So I probably got it from her. Nice. Yeah. Moms, they were. And then the Western things from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's from all our dads. That's right. That's right. It's a dad genre. It is. Okay. Well, are you on any social media? Is there anything that you... Just a Facebook page. I don't... I, I have... I, I'm on the English Department website at App State if somebody wants to reach me, but that's about it. I, I used to do a couple of comics blogs, but they're not functioning right now. So. Can you do me a favor and email sure. Greg a couple of books that you would recommend? Um, sure. Sure. For beginners. So he can put them in the show notes sure. um, and say these are the recommendations. Sure. And uh, if you happen to be going to ASU, I would look up this class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always I mean, in rotation. It's always in rotation. Maybe take a year off and wait if it's not in rotation that when you're going in. That's right. That's right. That's right. Or take the it's Western. Your... Take the Western and the horror. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I'm, well, we really appreciate you no, coming on. No, this was on. fun. I hope I hope I gave you something to work with. Like I said, I'd like to to circle back sure. in like a year or something and see how we've sure. changed and and looked. I'll at be things. a year older, so the radiation will be. More I cute. know. Well, we all will. <laughs> no, thanks for inviting at... me on. This was fun. I enjoyed this. That's so right. Thank you so much. We can't. It yep, was a lot thanks, of fun. Greg. This was a lot of fun. Thanks yeah, for learning us. I appreciate it. I, I hope I wasn't too pedantic. So you were not. Good. Good. All right. Nope. Well, have a great evening. I yep. will. I will. Thanks, guys. And I, I can't wait to hear the final results. So thank you for joining us for Wicked Ramblings. Remember, Karen and I are not experts, but in this case, Craig is. Also, the podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Please, no wagering on horror movies as a result of this podcast. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks for listening to the Scary Spirits Podcast, where the movies might be iffy, but the drinks are always solid. We would love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. Or go to our website, scaryspirits.com. And if you want the direct line, Email us at info at scaryspirits.com. If you really want to help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember, always drink responsibly. See you next week. Mm-hmm.